We are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make the world. Buddha. Introduction. The Illustrious Buddha. This is my simple religion. There is no need for temples, no need for complicated philosophy. Our own brain, our own heart is our temple. The philosophy is kindness. Dalai Lama. We've all seen Buddhist statues and monks in robes. We've heard about the Buddha and about meditation. But what does it all mean? How do we benefit from Buddhism? And what does it mean in our lives? What is nirvana besides a famous indie rock band? And is it possible to reach it? Are all Buddhists vegetarian? And do they worship idols? What are the benefits and dangers of meditation? The book is aimed at answering these questions and introducing you to the most important concepts of Buddhist thought in a way that makes sense to the average Western reader and in such a way that it can be easily put into practice. More and more people are investigating the ideas related to the Buddha, including mindfulness, inner peace, meditation, compassion, and more. Some of this interest is related to recent discoveries in particle science and also new insights into the science of the mind. As scientific inquiry opens up realms of exploration into the minuscule world of subatomic particles and into the realms of the mind, modern researchers are finding hidden gems in the teachings of the legendary Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. Things that are now coming to light were considered by Buddha 2,500 years ago. What is it all about? What is Buddhism really? Well, first of all, the word Buddha comes from the root buddhi, which means to awaken. This is an interesting idea. Surely the fact that we are conscious means that we're already awake? How can you be reading this sentence if you're asleep? We will take an in-depth look at this and many other questions throughout this book. The teachings of Buddha can lead towards a sense of enlightenment for you no matter what's your background, whether you're an atheist, agnostic, a Christian, or a follower of Islam, or any other system of belief, the teachings of the Buddha can enrich your life. His words speak to the heart and aren't concerned with dogma or academics. They invite each of us to approach reality as it is, for what it is, and to deepen our own experience of being alive on this planet. Filled with wisdom and compassion, these teachings echo many of the universal sentiments put forward by Jesus, Mohammed, Krishna, and even scientists like Albert Einstein, Sigmund Freud, and many others who lived before and after his time. A great many people have been deeply inspired by his ideas. Ideas about God do not really enter into Buddhism. The Buddha is not God or even a God, and he never claimed anything different. Although it is viewed as a religion and has many millions of adherents, it isn't truly about worshiping anything at all. It is about the simple facts of reality as experienced by each of us, and it is about the mind and the way the mind creates reality in all of us. Since there were no words to define mental concepts such as the subconscious or neurology back in those times, the teachings are simple yet incredibly insightful. Many of these old teachings were designed to be easy to memorize and adopt a particular cadence or rhythm to accomplish this. When reading this book, I invite you to consider it deeply and fairly, with heart, and to take out of it only what is valuable to you and what will benefit you in your own personal search for the truth. The teachings of the Buddha are not meant to be studied like a textbook, memorized in repeated parrot fashion. Instead, they are meant to be realized, on a deep, intuitive level. If, while reading this book, you get the sensation that the penny has dropped, or a light bulb moment, then it has accomplished its purpose. The Buddha said, By oneself one is purified. By oneself one is defiled. In other words, we have a deep responsibility to take charge of our inner worlds and to examine our own hearts and minds in search of truth. Teachers are there to guide us, but in the end, it comes down to our own decisions. Of all the world's belief systems, Buddhism is one of the most peaceful. Instead of making war on human beings with different beliefs, the Buddhist way is to struggle within, in our own hearts and minds, 
and to show compassion to our fellow human beings who are suffering from internal torments just as we are. These teachings appeal to people from all walks of life, the rich, the poor, the educated, and the not-so-educated. The universal truths uncovered by the Buddha are relevant to anyone who has a mind and to anyone who is conscious. It is a deep search into the nature of being, of reality itself, and it is put forward in a simple, practical, and useful way. So I invite you to share the story of the Buddha and the deep psychological understanding that he shared with us, still relevant two and a half thousand years after his death. Many of these teachings are resurfacing today among psychologists and laymen alike. Many self-help methodologies are based on the deep realization that he shared with the world so many years ago. Many of the new popular self-help gurus are simply restating the core message of the Buddha. I further invite you to challenge all that is written here and to test it for yourself. Take nothing as truth from any other person unless it rings true in your own mind and heart and opens up doors of understanding for you. Disregard all the rest as interesting, but ultimately useless. A Short Biography of the Buddha No introduction to Buddhism will be complete without at least a short mention of the life story of the Buddha. The charming story has inspired millions of people and holds within it many of the most valuable insights into the teachings we are about to consider. Over the years, the story of the birth, life, and death of this famous man has been embellished and many of the facts are disputed. Nevertheless, through all the different versions of the tale, the core idea remains the same. Let's take a look at a generally accepted version of the story. The birth of a great man. Around 563 BC, a boy was born to the king of the Sakya realm somewhere in the India-Nepal border in a park named Lumbini. Five days after his birth, the little prince received the name Siddhatra. His father was King Sarudana, and his mother was Queen Maya. One legend tells of a dream that Queen Maya had before giving birth to her son. In the dream, a beautiful white elephant descended from the heavens into her womb a sign that she would give birth to a universal emperor. Sadly, the queen died shortly after the birth of her son, and her younger sister took on the role of surrogate. There was much sadness for the queen, but the birth of her son was a cause for much comfort and rejoicing all over the realm. The naming ceremony was attended by an ascetic, a Sita, a holy man from the Himalayas, and he was most interested in the baby. To the surprise of all who saw it, the child's legs turned and rested on the matted locks of the old man. Instantly, Asita knew there was something special about the child, that he was destined to become the enlightened one. The Early Years Little Siddhartha, with a family named Gotama, was a very unusual child, as can be seen from the following episode. While the king and his family were all involved in the exciting plowing festival, the little prince sat by himself under a rose apple tree and became lost in meditation, looking at the wonders of nature around him. His incredible focus and rapt concentration brought exclamations of surprise from all that saw him. His entire youth was spent in a protected seclusion. The king made sure that no harm could possibly come to this sensitive, blessed young boy. Three lotus ponds were built especially for his amusement, and only the finest clothing touched his skin. Night and day, a parasol was held over his head so that no harsh sun or rain could harm him. Servants waited on his every need, and the boy was lacking for nothing. More than that, the king carefully planned things so that the boy would never see any sick, infirm, or elderly people. All signs of suffering were vigilantly kept away from his eyes. At the age of 16, he was betrothed to the beautiful Princess Yasodhara. Young Siddhartha excelled mentally and physically, and everything in his royal life was just roses. But the sensitive youth was not content. He developed an insatiable urge to explore the real world. He decided to visit a nearby town. The king got word of his intentions and made sure that the entire route to town was prepared, swept, and made ready. But it was useless. When Siddhartha finally made the journey, he saw an old man, the first he had ever laid eyes on. He inquired about the strange sight 
and was finally told the truth. Later on, he came across sickly people and saw a funeral procession. The veils of ignorance were lifted from his eyes, and he saw the ugly truth once and for all. While living in the lap of luxury, he realized the universal sorrow that comes with life. The last straw for the young prince was a meeting with a hermit, an ascetic holy man who had given up all material pursuits and followed a different way. Enthralled by the peace and tranquility that he saw in the old hermit's eyes, he made up his mind to leave his luxurious life behind and set out on his own to find the truth. Renunciations and Journeys By now, Siddhartha already had a child with his young bride, and his father the king was determined to change his mind, but it was no use. One night, the prince took one final look at his idyllic life, saw that his wife and child would never lack anything, and made his decision. Taking his horse, Kantaka, and accompanied by his loyal charioteer, Shanda, he stole away at midnight, leaving it all behind for good. Before leaving the city gates, Siddhartha exchanged his fine garments for the simple yellow robe of an ascetic, a seeker, and he shaved off all his hair. He sent Shanda home with the horse and set off alone. In this way, he gained the name Sakyamuni, or ascetic of the Sakya clan. It is noteworthy that he made the decision in the prime of his life with absolutely everything going for him. He was not defeated, impoverished, or disillusioned with his riches. He was a man who had absolutely everything that others dreamed of, and yet his yearning for truth was more powerful than the huge social pressure, the responsibilities of a father and a king-to-be, and every other thing in his life. He simply gave it all up as nothing, knowing full well that his happiness was connected to his inner craving for enlightenment. So he embarked on his search, which would last for the next few years, going from one teacher to the next and looking all over for the one thing he really desired, a very special kind of knowledge. The Search for Truth This part of the Buddha's life was all about seeking out answers to the questions he had formed while growing up. Why do we live, age, suffer, and finally die? He was filled with a burning desire to know, how does one obtain ultimate peace? What does it all mean? At this time in history, the place where Siddhartha lived, there were many holy men who proclaimed to have knowledge of these things. Monks and ascetics would go off into the forest or hills and perform certain practices which they claimed held the keys to attaining a very special state of mind. They would go without food and perform the most austere disciplines, withstanding pain, going without sleep, and training their bodies to hold their breath for a long time. For about six years, he wandered the land, going from one teacher or guru to the next. His unbending intent and his sharp mind came to good use and he soon surpassed his teachers, one after the other. They taught him ancient concentration techniques and methods to master the mind and the breath and the body. But still, Siddhartha was dissatisfied. After six long years, his body was reduced to almost a skeleton, and he was weak. His eyes were sunken. His skin was pale and deathlike. It was at this point that he realized the futility of starving the body and torturing his physical being. This was pointless, he decided, and just as harmful as a life of indulgence and greed. Instead, he decided that the middle way was more practical. Give the body what it needs and nothing more. He decided that he would never find the answers he longed for with these men and made up his mind to depart once more. His fellow students and teachers were horrified, thinking that he had given up his spiritual pursuits and turned to a worldly life. This didn't bother the former prince in the least. His mind was set on attaining what he had longed for since childhood, and nothing would stop him. So he set off to find the answers elsewhere. He finally realized that the answers he sought were to be found not in the forest or on a mountain, but inside him. Discipline of the body led to weakness, but discipline of the mind had led him to peace and insight while he was still just a boy. He remembered his time under the rose apple tree. He decided to follow his own way. Wandering throughout the countryside, he finally came upon an idyllic setting beneath a kind of fig tree, Ficus religioso, the famous Bodhi tree. 
Here, a kind woman offered him a bowl of rice milk, and he slowly started to regain his strength. Enlightenment of the Buddha His mind firmly made up, Siddhartha Gautama decided that he would sit under that tree until he found the answers that he was looking for. The account of this titanic struggle has come to be mythologized as a struggle with a fierce demon called Mara. The name means destruction, and it symbolizes the mind's power to ensnare and delude us by means of our own passions and fears. The attacks came in the form of fearful apparitions and attempts to distract him with sensual pleasures, beautiful women, and all manner of distractions. This is the way of our minds. We constantly attach ourselves to dreams of what could be and what we wish for or fear. Prepared for this struggle by his unique life experiences, having gone through the best and the worst that this world has to offer, Siddhartha persevered, centered his mind, and did not tire. He had already given up on a life pursuing pleasure and sense gratification by leaving the stately palace and his royal life far behind him. His energetic pursuit of spiritual knowledge had given him unshakable discipline and an incredible willpower. He had nothing left to lose. So he meditated under the Bodhi tree and achieved a particular state of mind which is known as single-pointed mind or one-pointed concentration. Focusing on his breath, he stilled the constant chatter of the mind and entered a state of bliss, and his mind was flooded with insights. Thus he achieved enlightenment and became known as the Buddha, or Enlightened One. Disillusioned with all the teachings he had found and unsatisfied with all his previous teachers, he pondered the meaning of his own existence with the utmost concentration and found his own way. Legend holds that he sat under the tree for seven days, keeping the same posture and rapt concentration. When he finally rose, he was a changed man, the great teacher. At first, the Buddha was reluctant to teach people. Words can be treacherous, and he realized that the way to enlightenment is not by studying books, but rather by confronting the mind and the experience of life head-on. How could he share this knowledge? But his teachings would become very widely known. After his enlightenment, he wandered to Deer Park in Isipatana, now part of Uttar Pradesh, India. He met some of his former fellow students and related his experience. They begged him to tell them more, and out of compassion, he decided to teach others the way to the great freedom he had found on his own. From that point onwards, until his 80th year, the Buddha wandered throughout the region, teaching all who would listen about the great insights that he had attained under the famous tree. Many thousands of followers were attracted to the unusual teachings of this humble, unassuming man. He demanded nothing from his listeners and tirelessly taught everyone that he could. His followers eventually came to include many of those he had left behind, including his father, King Suddhodana, his wife, and his son. Until his last day in the world, he taught the same basic truth, the way to enlightenment, and his final words before he died were, Behold, O monks, this is my last advice to you. All component things in the world are changeable. They are not lasting. Work hard to gain your own salvation. The Basic Teachings of the Buddha Walk as if you are kissing the earth with your feet. Thich Nhat Hanh the background of the life of Siddhartha Gautama, who became the enlightened Buddha, gives us a good place to start considering what Buddhism really is. It is the result of his own personal inquiry into the nature of reality, considering things as they are. Of course, this is the claim of many philosophical and religious views, too. So what makes Buddhism different? Buddhism does not concern itself with abstract philosophical ponderings about God, creation, evolution, or anything along those lines. It is focused on how to attain liberation from suffering and has its foundations in four noble truths that the Buddha uncovered. These were not strictly his theories, but rather observations about natural laws or simple truths, and the invitation is open for anyone to question them or to verify them for yourself. The Four Noble Truths The first noble truth is the idea of suffering. In other words, life is a struggle. This is a simple fact and isn't just a pessimistic point of view. 
We all suffer in life, rich or poor, old or young, no matter who we are. We all dream of an idyllic life, but even once we get some of the things that we believe will make us happy, pain is sure to follow. We might make enormous sums of money only to find that this brings no lasting joy. We might win the love of the one person in the world that we believe will make us happy only to find that the same troubles in life find us and ruin our happiness. Everything is temporary and nothing lasts. Soon enough, each one of us has to face sickness, old age, and finally death. This is the cause of our suffering. Of course, this doesn't mean that life is empty and meaningless and that there is nothing good. It simply points to the fact that all this happiness is quite temporary because it can't be maintained forever. The truth is that each one of us desires to be happy all the time. The term dukkha is used to name the suffering. It means contemptible emptiness devoid of reality. This refers to our constant chasing after imaginary happiness. As soon as the elusive object of our happiness is achieved, it soon turns into an object of scorn or dissatisfaction. While all of us enjoy some form of happiness in life, and we cherish certain experiences, this happiness tends to be fleeting. It isn't permanent. The second noble truth is related to the origin of this suffering, our own craving, desires, passions, and fears. The Dhammapada states, From craving springs grief. From craving springs fear. For him who is wholly free from craving, there is no grief, much less fear. What are we craving? Life itself, in all its splendor and all its horror. We crave the experience of life. We desire certain things and fear others. We are attached to the sensation of this craving and cannot easily let it go. It is all tied up with our own sense of self, our identity. We desire certain things and reject others. We crave certain experiences. We want honor, enjoyment, success, or whatever the case may be. This is what ultimately creates suffering for us, since it is impossible to satisfy this craving. It is an itch which cannot be scratched. As soon as one craving is satisfied, we immediately crave the next thing. The Rolling Stones song springs to mind. I can't get no satisfaction. I try, and I try, and I try. The reality is that our bodies need certain basic things to survive, like water, air, and food. When it is cold, we need warm clothes so we don't freeze to death. The trouble is that most of us desire far more than the true necessities of life. Our desires are endless. We are attached to grasping, the constant attempt to satisfy desires that can never be satisfied. This doesn't mean that we should deny ourselves food or become moralistic in terms of material things. The problem lies in the mind, the way we identify with physical things. We feel incomplete unless we are chasing something. The problem is the constant mental craving for stimulation, the constant grasping after imaginary straws. The third noble truth is related to the cessation of this suffering. How do we end the cycle? by overcoming our own self-created delusions, by pondering the truth of existence as it is, not in theory but in practice, one can see that we can create our own suffering by constantly wishing things were different but being unable to change them. We need to let go. While it might be easy to see the validity of the first noble truth, the fact that life is suffering, it becomes increasingly more difficult to gain the insight into the cause of this suffering and how to end it. These truths must be realized inwardly. It doesn't help to read them, study them, or repeat them. Only once you realize for yourself that you are making yourself miserable can you begin to change things. Until then, you will blame your dissatisfaction on everything else besides yourself. It is his fault. It's just the way things work. If only I had this or that, and so on, until eternity. The ultimate goal of Buddhism is nirvana, nibbana, the complete cessation of suffering. This is achieved by eradicating craving from the mind, letting go of all inward attachment to all outward events. The Buddha was simply pointing out that it is possible to escape from this constant suffering, and this brings us to the fourth and final noble truth. The fourth noble truth is about the way to nirvana, the how-to section. The Buddha set out a way to attain this by means of the so-called 
Noble Eightfold Path. This is something that anyone who wants to achieve nirvana can follow to help along the way. It avoids the extremes of self-mortification and self-indulgence, both of which tend to blunt the mind and the senses. It consists of the following eight factors. 1. Right understanding. 2. Right thoughts. 3. Right speech. 4. Right action. 5. Right livelihood. 6. Right effort. 7. Right mindfulness. And 8. Right concentration. In other words, it all begins with realization or understanding of the Four Noble Truths. Once you realize that life is suffering and that we cause the suffering by our own delusions, the path towards freedom becomes clear. All our thoughts and actions are linked to our understanding of the nature of reality. And once we realize these truths, the rest follows naturally. Once again, it isn't simply a matter of academic or book knowledge. Each of us creates our own reality with the constant inner dialogues we maintain in our heads. This is all linked to our early childhood background and what we were taught about the world and the way things were. According to the teachings of Buddha, all of us suffer from our own delusions and all of us are living in a kind of self-created state of dissatisfaction. This is why compassion is such an important part of Buddhism. Once you realize that, just like you, everyone else is struggling too, your heart begins to open, and the annoying, hurtful things that people do start to become less offensive and more about an opportunity to show compassion. The angry man who cut you off in traffic and cursed you is simply ignorant of the way he is creating his own reality, his own suffering. Therefore, it is simply pointless to get involved in an angry argument. Better to just let things be. This way you maintain your own balance and peace and might even influence him to reconsider his way. Coming back to some of the questions raised in the introduction to this book, why are there so many statues and images of the Buddha? Are these to be worshipped? Certainly not. As we've seen, Buddhism is not about religion in the strict sense. The Buddha was not a god nor a god of any kind. Statues of Buddha are not there to be worshipped, though many Buddhists are moved by respect when seeing these images. They are not to be venerated as gods, but serve only as reminders of the peaceful solution that Buddha extended to others through compassion. They are often depicted in meditative poses, seated cross-legged, and often the face is represented in sublime peace. This serves to remind one of the ultimate goal of Buddhism, peace and happiness. Concerning the question of vegetarianism, many sects in Buddhist tradition encourage a simple, nutritious diet. They caution against an unhealthy attachment to the appetite and counsel followers to provide simply what is necessary for the body. In fact, many Buddhists do not eat meat, and there's nothing wrong with it. Practically, though, many people choose to become vegetarian since it is easier to digest vegetables than meat, and it makes for a better meditative experience. There are no real hard rules, though, depending on which branch of Buddhism you consider. Happiness. After reading about the Four Noble Truths, you might think that Buddhism is based on quite a pessimistic outlook. The truth is that it is realistic, and neither pessimistic nor unrealistically optimistic. The Buddha impressed many thousands of people with his serene, peaceful demeanor without having to say a word. The insight he gained under the Bodhi tree did not make him miserable, but showed him the way to peace and contentment. This shone through in all his teachings. He was no prophet of doom, but realized the truth about the misery and unhappiness in the hearts of his listeners. He extended serene, peaceful compassion to all, and the people were drawn to him like a magnet. He wasted no time on pointless philosophical ramblings and explanations about science and history, but focused instead on the path to liberation that lay open to anyone who chose to follow it. In the Buddhist view, joy is to be cultivated. Unlike the religious teachings that hold out threats of damnation and hellfire to sinners, Buddhists are free from this fear. By casting off unhealthy attachments to meaningless things in life, their lives are freed up to include more happiness. The Buddha showed that in the end, even suffering leads to happiness. When we suffer, we tend to question reality more than when we are self-satisfied. This leads to a kind of inner confidence and knowledge. 
This eventually leads us to question things and to find the ultimate truth for ourselves without any teachings or dogma of any kind whatsoever. This in turn leads to liberation, acceptance, and joy. According to the Buddha, our joy will not be found in pursuit of success, power, or money. The joy comes naturally from within. In fact, it is our natural state. Our own self-created suffering is all that separates us from this natural joy. Tolerance. Buddhists are arguably the most tolerant people in the world as a group. They tolerate the beliefs and feelings of others rather than insisting on their own views. They do not engage in religious warfare and prefer not to argue about their point of view. The teachings of the Buddha appeal to common sense, rationality, and even mindedness. They avoid religious extremism. Aldous Huxley, author of The Doors of Perception, wrote, Alone of all the great world religions, Buddhism makes its way without persecution, censorship, or inquisition. In all these respects, its record is enormously superior to that of other religions, which made its way among people wedded to materialism and which was able to justify the bloodthirsty tendencies of its adherents by an appeal to savage Bronze Age literature. Buddhism is saturated with the spirit of free inquiry and complete tolerance. Instead of hard commandments instructing followers what they may or may not do, it offers wise guidance, counsel, and invites people to see the truth for themselves. One of the most important ideas relating to tolerance is the deep insight that violence and anger cannot be conquered by violence and anger. Only love can conquer them. Hatred is not appeased by hatred. By love alone is hatred appeased. This is the eternal law. Different kinds of Buddhism. If there is any religion in the world that could respond to the needs of modern science, it would be Buddhism. Albert Einstein. Buddhism has changed and developed in a number of different ways since the death of the famous man, Siddhartha Gautama, who became the Buddha. His teachings were further spread by his faithful students, and over the years they have reached all over the globe. As the teachings seeped into various cultures, they gained much, lost much, and adapted to the lives of very different cultures in Asia and beyond. Over 2,500 years, many different elements have been combined with the original core message. Unlike certain religious teachings and sects, the Buddhist way is based largely on one's personal experience and practice, and it isn't very concerned with dogma, differences of approach, and theology. This means that a student of one branch of Buddhism will be completely comfortable in the ways of another branch, and there is no division or animosity between them. It is not about one form being more correct or truer than another. The approaches are different in practical day-to-day -day ways. The main divisions of Buddhism are Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, and Zen Buddhism. Let's take a look at each one briefly to get a better idea. Theravada. This is the most ancient form of Buddhism, popular in Southeast Asia, in countries such as Thailand, Miramar, Burma, Cambodia, and Laos. The name literally means Doctrine of the Elders, and is based on the early Pali writings, the Tipitaka, that recorded much of what Buddha said and did. This form is probably the strictest and most severe of the lot and places much emphasis on meditation. The goal of existence is seen as to escape from this world of suffering into the eternal peaceful nirvana. It has a certain claim on being the most authentic version of Buddhism, though that doesn't necessarily mean much. Since enlightenment is a very personal thing, any approach to Buddhism is equally valid. Mahayana. This offshoot of the original Theravada teachings is more focused on compassion. Traditions in this line of development include Tibetan, Pure Land, and Tantric Buddhism. The Dalai Lama comes from this background. The branch is sometimes referred to as the Great Vehicle, or Northern Branch, and contains more speculative metaphysics dealing with the nature of reality and enlightenment. At the heart of the Mahayana is the Bodhisattva ideal, a bodhisattva is a being who tries to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings in search of a path leading to the end of suffering. 
However innumerable sentient beings are, I vow to save them. However inexhaustible the defilements are, I vow to extinguish them. However immeasurable the dharmas are, I vow to master them. However incomparable enlightenment is, I vow to attain it. The Bodhisattva Vow Vajrayana This was the last of the three major branches of Buddhism to form, and it provides an accelerated path to enlightenment. In this tradition, the physical and spiritual aspects of life are seen to be complementary, and the teachings include many rituals, chanting, and tantric techniques. Much of the local Indian and Tibetan culture found its way into the traditions of this branch. Ideas about tantra, chakras, and life energy found a comfortable place beside the meditative teachings of the Buddha. Vajrayana emphasizes concentration during meditation and visualization techniques, the benefits which are said to carry over into future incarnations. The famous Tibetan Book of the Dead, or Bardo Thal, forms one part of this tradition. Many of the colorful rituals and deities linked to earlier teachings were adapted to fit with the basic teachings concerning enlightenment. Zen Buddhism Life and death are of supreme importance. Time swiftly passes by and opportunity is lost. Each of us should strive to awaken. Awaken. Take heed. Do not squander your life. Dogen Zenji This famous branch of Buddhism is said to have originated in China with the teachings of the famous monk Bodhidharma. This form of teaching is less concerned with scriptural study and takes a more practical, meditative, and direct approach. The famous Zen masters, Zazen Meditation, and Satori belong to this branch. A special transmission outside the scriptures, no dependence on words and letters, direct pointing to the mind of man, seeing into one's nature and attaining Buddhahood, Bodhidharma. First and foremost, Zen is a practice rather than a theory. It does not concern itself so much with the why, when, and where, as much as with the how-to of Buddhism. It is so simple, in fact, that many find it hard to grasp. Conditioned throughout life to study theory, to ask rational questions, and to understand the semantics of things, Zen comes as quite a shock to many people. The path to enlightenment cannot really be explained. It has to be experienced directly. Zen teachings have nothing to do with immortal souls and afterlife or God. The focus is on being present in the current moment, not dreaming of some imaginary future. Buddhism in general does not require followers to have faith in anything that they cannot verify for themselves. This makes it extremely practical and logical. A big part of Zen teaching comes in the form of cones. These are short parables or stories containing deep truths. Zen students are meant to ponder over these cones for a long time until the various subtle shades of meaning become clear. In a way, this parallels the mystery of nature, which similarly provides no direct answers, but draws us on to discover the answers for ourselves. In Zen, one does not study lots of words and theories. Instead, students are encouraged to seek out the paradoxical nature of the truth for themselves. Cones are expertly crafted in order to provoke thought. Here are two short examples. What was your original face? The one you had before your parents gave birth to you? The stone mind. Ho Jin, a Chinese Zen teacher, lived alone in a small temple in the country. One day, four traveling monks appeared and asked if they might make a fire in his yard to warm themselves. While they were building the fire, Ho Jin heard them arguing about subjectivity and objectivity. He joined them and said, There is a big stone. Do you consider it to be inside or outside your mind? One of the monks replied, From the Buddhist viewpoint, everything is an objectification of mind, so I would say that the stone is inside my mind. Your head must feel very heavy, observed Ho Jin, if you are carrying around a stone like that in your mind. The simplicity and direct approach to the subject has found many fans in the West. It does not require much study nor any rituals or formulas. It simply is what it is. Sitting in meditation posture, the Zen student is led to experience mind directly without any interference from the outside. Sitting quietly, the student simply lets go of the ego and unconscious mind and emerging with the reality of the here and now 
of the universe automatically follows. No bells and whistles, no strings attached. Before enlightenment, chopping wood, carrying water. After enlightenment, chopping wood, carrying water. Meditation. It is like the lighted torch whose flame can be distributed to ever so many other torches, which people may bring along, and therewith they will cook food and dispel darkness, while the original torch itself remains burning ever the same. It is even so with the bliss of the way. Sutra of 42 Sections Gotama Buddha All the different forms of Buddhism point to controlling or stilling the mind as the pathway to peace, self-discovery, and happiness. By getting to know your own inner world better, and by examining how we habitually think, fret, worry, and chatter away in our own heads, we are able to address the source of suffering directly. We come to know that we are creating our own inner reality, and that it is possible to gradually master this strange landscape. Most of us develop a way to manage our thinking, our moods, and our emotions. We learn from our parents and from the people around us to manage things in a more or less effective and acceptable way. These unconscious habits we develop make a huge difference in our day-to-day lives. They set the tone for our entire lives. The trouble is that it all happens in a kind of sleep, We are not truly conscious that we are developing these habits and mental strategies. We mimic others and hope for the best. On rare occasions, we might question ourselves inwardly, but it seldom leads anywhere. Some of us are taught various moral precepts to be good boys and girls, but it is all concerned with outward actions and interaction with society. We grow up ignorant of the most important element in our lives, the inner world. World religions offer some guidance, but many people have turned away from these institutions because they don't offer effective strategies to cope with life. They don't solve our problems. Going to a building and listening to a sermon isn't enough. Singing hymns, praying, and following ceremonial procedures feels a little empty to many people. They crave something real, a direct experience of spiritual matters. What they find are just empty words. Of course, this is not true of everyone. For a great many people, their religion offers a sense of security, a place to find relief from the cruel world and all the troubles in life. By throwing their sins and their cares onto the shoulders of the great religious organization, they feel unburdened and safe. However, most Westerners are not used to meditation. It seems foreign, unnatural, and many religious people seem to think that it opens unnatural doors to the mind leaving one open to demonic or other negative influences. By this logic, half of the Asian world should be stark raving mad. The truth is that meditation is the most natural thing in the world. Instead of leaving the mind open to negative influences, it brings calm, balanced, and strength to the mind. It is refreshing and very healthy for the body. Modern science has discovered many benefits to the heart, circulatory system, and the nervous system that come from regular meditation. It is interesting that with all the advances in science and technology, the mind remains a great mystery. Scientists have studied the structure of the brain and the nervous system, and psychologists have formulated theory after theory about what consciousness really is. The trouble with this study is that each of us has a very individualized experience of being alive and being conscious. How does one study this experience in a laboratory? Scientists can observe brainwave patterns in various regions of the brain that become more or less active, but as the experience itself, they have to rely on what the subject says about it. There is no way to test this very subjective, personal experience. It cannot be measured, quantified, or captured in a graph. It is noteworthy that in recent years, mindfulness and awareness have become catchwords among psychological circles. People involved in studying the mind have realized the great wisdom in what the Buddha said 2,500 years ago. The key to all this is to achieve a special state of mind, one where the mind reflects on itself. It involves a kind of willful, directed evolution of consciousness. The Buddha studied meditation techniques with his early teachers, but the breakthrough moment for him came when he sat all alone under the Bodhi tree, 
and question his own inner space. By creating an absolute silence in the constant stream of mental chatter, it was possible to transcend normal states of mind and achieve direct, intuitive knowledge of the truth. This is the basic aim of meditation. If you have never tried it before, investigate it for yourself. Pay attention to what is going on in your thinking and see if you can stop the chatter for a minute or two. You will discover that, simple as it is, it is actually incredibly difficult to truly master your own thinking by means of willpower. Thoughts simply keep intruding and distractions are endless. More often than not, you will catch your mind off on a tangent of its own, following one association after the next. The Buddha taught a number of different methods to get to grips with this tendency of the mind. When our thoughts run away with us, we become anxious and distracted. Some people are more thoughtful than others, some are more physical than others, and others prefer visual stimuli to sounds. Each of us has his own nature. The Buddha showed ways for each type of person to use specific tools to train and manage the mind, the source of all of our suffering. After meditation, everything remains as it was before, except everything has changed. For some, he recommended focusing on objects, simple, colorful pictures, or natural things. For others, he advised chanting and mantras, a more auditory tool to bring quietude to the mind. In all forms of meditation, it is useful to consider a few basic things in order to make the meditation more effective. Place. Distractions are the number one enemy of effective meditation. Once you have sufficiently developed your concentration, distractions will intrude on the practice less and less. But in the beginning, it is useful to find a quiet, safe, and comfortable place to meditate. Natural surroundings are better than man-made places, but not all of us are fortunate enough to have easy access to quiet, natural surroundings. Posture. It is possible to meditate in any posture, whether sitting, standing, or lying down, or even while working. However, the classic meditation posture is the best in the long run. By sitting with your legs crossed, the back straight, and the hands folded in your lap, you are able to naturally control the mind more easily. If this is not possible for you, you can use a chair or even lie down. Timing. In the beginning, five minutes a day will be enough. But as you become more skilled at meditation, you will naturally want to extend your practice for longer and longer. The feeling of refreshment and tranquility you experience will naturally deepen your practice. Try to meditate when others are either away or asleep. This will make it less intrusive to their lives and you will benefit from having no distractions. Two of the most widely applicable and useful methods are to use the breath and to use loving-kindness meditation. Let's look at these two in a little more detail to get an idea about what meditation is all about. Mindfulness of breathing. As the name implies, this meditation uses the breath as a tool to focus the mind. This is a basic starting point to meditation, and the Buddha himself used a form of this meditation when he became enlightened. Loving-kindness meditation adds another element to the basic starting point. As one meditates on the breath, especially in the beginning, the mind keeps wandering, and each time it does, you simply bring your focus back to the sensation of breathing. Simply following the breath as it enters and leaves your body again, your mind slowly settles down, becoming calm and focused, and the whole body begins to enter a very deep, tranquil state of relaxation. For someone new to this, the relaxation might be something that you've quite forgotten was possible, and years of tension will begin to unknot itself from your head and shoulders. To start off with, it is useful to count each inhalation, this is simply a way to keep the mind concentrated on only one thing, and there is no real benefit in holding your breath for a long time or exhausting yourself trying to regulate the breath. Simply breathe naturally and concentrate on keeping the mind from wandering. As you progress in this meditation technique, you will slowly develop more and more skill at quieting the mind, and you'll start to enjoy very deep, peaceful moments of complete calm. This is the mind and the body's natural state, and the peace that you experience is simply there waiting to be accessed. 
There is nothing unnatural or supernatural about it, but rather, as you progress in meditation, you naturally find a sense of enjoyment in the most mundane things, the sunlight, the wind, or the sky. Your eyes become open to the natural wonders surrounding us, and you are able to savor each moment simply for what it is. A little bit of this peace and calm follows you throughout your day, and the serenity can be made more and more continuous. There is no need for theory, belief in any teachings, or knowledge of any kind at all. The body and breath itself become the teachers, and the reality itself the textbook. As you are engaged in your meditation, the mind will continue to try to go its own way. You might experience itches or feel uncomfortable. The challenge is to withstand all these distractions and stay completely focused. With each small victory, your peace will gain depth, and your concentration will grow. It is written, Mindfully he inhales, mindfully he exhales. 1. When making a long inhalation, he knows, I make a long inhalation. When making a long exhalation, he knows, I make a long exhalation. 2. When making a short inhalation, he knows, I make a short inhalation. When making a short exhalation, he knows, I make a short exhalation. 3. Clearly perceiving the entire breathing process, i.e. the beginning, middle, and end, I will inhale. Thus he trains himself, clearly perceiving the entire breathing process. I will exhale. Thus he trains himself. 4. Calming the respiration. I will inhale, thus he trains himself. Calming the respirations, I will exhale, thus he trains himself. After some time and lots of practice, this meditation begins to change all by itself. As you become more and more conscious of the sensations of the breathing flowing through the body, you are able to dissolve deep tensions from the spine and internal organs. It begins to feel like rivers of tingling are flowing throughout the body, nourishing and relaxing, healing, and calming every nerve and every cell. Some people report feeling as if the whole body is melting away, and they experience vast, expansive tranquility. At first, you might be wary of the trickery of the mind and put it all down to an active imagination. That's perfectly fine. The imagination is a great thing. After a while, though, through your own experimentation with meditation, you will discover for yourself how the mind, the body, and the breath work together. As Westerners, we are not introduced to these kinds of concepts. They might seem strange or fanciful. They might come across as weird or unnatural. But by trying it for yourself, you will discover your own version of the truth of this notion. For each of us, it is slightly different. But we all have brains, lungs, and nervous systems that work in very much the same ways. With practice and experimentation, you will discover your own way. Loving-kindness meditation. This meditation follows on from the previous one. Once you've achieved a relatively calm state using the method we just described, you can then start speaking to yourself inwardly. The idea is to fill the mind with thoughts and words related to loving-kindness, starting with yourself. Tell yourself that you are worthwhile, protected, strong, capable, and that you have much love. Gradually expand outwards to include your family and friends, other people, and eventually all creatures large and small. You might want to develop your own mantra or simply speak naturally from the heart. Forgive yourself, encourage yourself, remind yourself of your true natural state. Radiate good wishes to all creatures. This method of mind influence will have a tremendous effect in your everyday life. When confronted with difficult situations, angry people, or the usual stresses and strains of life, you will find yourself strangely peaceful and have a very subtle change of attitude, where normally you wouldn't hesitate to get involved in an argument, trying to stick up for your own imagined rights. You might simply let the issue go realizing from the outset that arguing is going to be a big waste of energy. As you practice regularly, you will become more forgiving, both to yourself and to others. People will become more attracted to you since you will start radiating a warm, encouraging spirit, 
a kind of easy happiness that others will find irresistible. Even those that you were previously indifferent or uncaring towards will notice a change, and this can only be good. You will begin to notice that your mind is an awesome tool. Without saying a word, you will start to influence situations and opinions simply by your loving, concentrated attention. Things which seemed closed off and impossible will start to seem possible. Opportunities will start to appear. By training the mind, we start to become more self-reliant instead of wishing that others would pay us more attention or wishing that others would behave differently towards us. We start to become secure in our own company. People's opinion about us becomes less and less important. Instead of the futile hope that our surroundings will become somehow better, we can instantly take charge of our inner world and make positive changes. While it might not be possible to change others or even our natural circumstances, we can accept those things that we cannot change and change ourselves instead. Happiness is no longer dependent on others, on money, on anything at all. It is simply naturally present. The fact is that everything is temporary, including our own lives. Meditation is a tool to help you reach a state of natural flow instead of fearing or resisting change. We learn to adapt, to flow with the change, no matter what, and a deep, peaceful, and accepting state of mind starts to develop within. Here's an example of how to train your mind inwardly from Narada Mayathera, Buddhist Publication Society. As you reach a calmed meditation state, think like this. My mind is temporarily pure, free from all impurities, free from lust, hatred, and ignorance, free from evil thoughts. My mind is pure and clean. Like a polished mirror is my stainless mind. As a clean and empty vessel is filled with pure water, I now fill my clean heart and pure mind with peaceful and sublime thoughts of boundless loving kindness, overflowing compassion, sympathetic joy, and perfect equanimity. I have now washed my mind and heart of anger, ill will, cruelty, violence, jealousy, envy, passion, and aversion. Think ten times. May I be well and happy. May I be free from suffering, disease, grief, worry, and anger. May I be strong, confident, healthy, and peaceful. Here the term I is used in a conventional sense. Think thus. Now I charge every particle of my system from head to foot with thoughts of boundless loving kindness and compassion. I am the embodiment of loving kindness and compassion. My whole body is saturated with loving kindness and compassion. I am a stronghold, a fortress of loving kindness and compassion. I am nothing but loving kindness and compassion. I have sublimated myself, elevated myself, ennobled myself. Think ten times. May I be well and happy. May I be free from suffering, disease, grief, worry, and anger. May I be strong, self-confident, healthy, and peaceful. By using this formula, or something similar, so long as it is focused on love, your meditation will begin to take on a new dimension. You will become aware of inner feelings associated with love. It feels like expansion, relaxation, and bubbling energy. This can be felt most strongly in the center of the chest radiating outwards. The mind is quiet but awake and alert, and the emotions are engaged, streaming inwards and outwards naturally. Old emotional wounds are being healed, and the heart is opening up and becoming supple and happy again. We start to become used to the inner feeling of being happy, something that might have been forgotten. Slowly, a serene inner smile starts to accompany us, secretly, inwardly, but very strong and very warm. Opening the Heart Today's world favors the mind over the heart. We are constantly learning new things, understanding new technology, and using our minds to make a living. Many of us tend to overthink things. Having picked up the habit during our educational years, we continue to analyze and critically examine everything with the intellect. 
The path to spiritual understanding lies elsewhere, though. Our minds are indeed incredible instruments, and they allow us to experience life on a very different plane or level to the animal kingdoms around us. However, ignoring the heart or living only in terms of intellectual understanding leads to imbalance and unhappiness. Our emotions and the figurative heart is the source of our energy. The mind is the guide. As human beings, we have a deep intuitive craving for more than pure thought. These impulses reside in the figurative heart. This is the center of love and compassion and is also the place from which our deepest insights arise. For our meditation practices to be effective, it needs to unlock the heart. Studying the theory of Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths, and the Enlightenment with mind only will be ultimately pointless. It is one thing to know and another thing to do. Going through the experiences of life, our hearts gradually become closed up and covered by layers of disappointments, anxieties, regrets, and fears. Things did not turn out for us the way we dreamed they would, and so slowly we become closed off and unhappy. Of course, there are moments of joy and peace, and happy things do happen from time to time, but the joy is soon lost, and habitual resentment soon follows. By opening the heart, we can begin to change things. The world will remain as it is, but inwardly we will begin to regain our natural serenity. This takes time and skill to accomplish. Many of us feel closed up, defensive, and in fact, we don't feel much at all. During the meditation process, though, it is possible to start undoing the damage. By quieting the mind and allowing our feelings the freedom to exist, our hearts gradually open and allow feelings to flow again. The subtle feeling is a source of guidance. Our hearts can advise us on the wisdom of any particular choice, can warn us of dangers, and be a source of joy and comfort. While meditating, pay particular attention to the heart area in your chest. Listen carefully to the sound of your own heart pumping and allow whatever comes up to come up without fear or judgment. Gradually, you will cut through all the coarse muck covering your spirit, and your intuitive inner voice will begin to speak to you. This is a very personal and subjective thing, and people experience it in their own ways. Some hear a kind of voice. Others just feel a sensation. What is common to all, though, is a warm, accepting, and positive feeling. Things feel right, and you feel right about things. When inner harmony starts to rule, the mind and emotions are no longer at war. Once our hearts are open, all existence appears naturally beautiful and harmonious. Our problems seem more manageable, and our relationships with others take quantum leaps forward. The open heart fosters a feeling of genuineness. Gone are the superficial layers of personality that we have adopted to try to make our way through the maze of social intercourse. Gone are the fake cells we invent to better deal with problems. In its place is a simple, open, and honest self, not bound by any fears of disappointment, no longer burdened by the desire to live up to any artificial standards. We simply are what we are, and that's more than good enough. If others don't like it, that is their right and their choice, but it no longer makes any difference inwardly. This is the essence of self-love. It doesn't make us arrogant, self-righteous, or selfish, but instead it awakens our compassion for others and nourishes our minds and bodies with good feelings instead of the constant barren desert we experienced before. Compassion is the means by which the world's problems may be solved. What gets in the way of our compassion is our own ego, the delusion that we are different from and wiser than everyone else. Instead of expecting something in return for our emotional and physical efforts, we can learn to simply give without expecting anything in return. Why not? This frees us from disappointment when others don't recognize our actions for what they are and when they are blind to our worth. These feelings of frustration and anger start to die down, and eventually, they don't even surface anymore. We no longer need the acceptance and praise of others, because on the inside is the source of all the happiness we could ever need. Relaxing and Expanding Consciousness The body is more involved in our experience 
of living, feeling, and thinking than we give it credit for. Most of us lose touch with our bodies as we go through the stresses and strains of life. This shows up in the spine, the neck, and the head as tense muscles that never seem to relax. Constant pain and tension cycle through these areas, robbing us of deep relaxation. As a society, Westerners have lost the habit of self-care. We leave the diagnosis and cure of all of our ailments up to the professionals. We take pills and follow diets. We watch TV shows, and we are mesmerized by the stunning new medical technologies. What we tend to forget is that health and illness begin with us. We are responsible for the upkeep of our systems. The mind, the body, and the breath need to be reunited and harmoniously balanced. When starting the meditation practice, it is a good idea to learn to consciously relax again. Believe it or not, you've most probably forgotten how. When we are children, our bodies tend to be supple and loose, and we breathe and move easily and naturally. During our lives, we lose these healthy habits and tend to be tense or to develop bad posture and store all manner of tensions in our bodies. It is possible to undo this gradually by willing the body into deep, peaceful relaxation. It takes a little practice, but it is possible. If it is possible and comfortable for you, Sit in the full lotus position with the left foot resting on the right thigh and the right foot on the left thigh. This is quite a challenge for most adults, though the posture is less important than intention. So whatever posture feels comfortable for you, use that. Then starting with the head and working down to the toes, completely relax each and every muscle. As you breathe, pay attention to the sensation of the breath moving through the body. Take a few long, deep breaths and exhale slowly, feeling your entire body relax. Just pay attention to the sensations of tensing and relaxing wherever they may occur. Slowly, as you go along, you will become completely absorbed and the relaxation will begin to deepen more and more. Remember, you're attempting to undo the stresses and strains of years of worry and anxiety, so don't expect to get rid of all of it at once. Slowly and patiently, by sticking to the practice, you'll learn to let go more and more, and the feeling of relaxation and contentment will become more and more familiar. Most of us hold a lot of tension in our heads and necks, so start there. Simply feel the sensations in your muscles, on your skin, and inside your body. You will notice tensions, blockages, rough spots, and different sensations. Just let it all be. Your body naturally wants to achieve a state of balanced hemostasis, and by allowing the sensations to flow, you are encouraging healing and balance. This is a very useful skill to master. The time it takes to learn to relax completely will be well worth it, both physically and mentally. When you are deeply relaxed, the whole body feels warm and good. It might feel as if you're becoming completely empty and all the tension is leaving your body. The mind remains alert to all that is happening, but you are no longer divided and scattered. Harmony starts to take over again, and you gradually return to your natural happy and healthy state. Healing is accelerated, and all manner of illness can be avoided by maintaining this balance. There are no instructions to remember, and no complicated rituals or procedures. The body will let you know where the problems are, and you simply let the breath flow through the pain, the irritation, and the tension, and the problem naturally dissolves. The brain and nervous system and every cell and tissue in the body is nourished and repaired. Sometimes miraculous healings occur this way, although, to be fair, it might take time, and some things cannot be undone once they are done you will start to become aware of a kind of energy moving throughout the body and these sensations start to expand and you begin to forget about the body and the breath. The mind at first distracted and scattered, full of inner dialogues and anxieties, slowly starts to settle and a deep peace follows. It is possible to expand this feeling and as you do so, there are no thoughts about who is feeling or what you are feeling. All analysis comes to an end and the experience itself takes over, becomes the teacher, and all is well. 
As we progress to deeper and deeper states of meditation, these feelings become very deep and meaningful. They are more enjoyable than any temporary satisfaction, such as drinking, dancing, sensual pleasure, or even lovemaking. They are serene and become a kind of inner refuge. Whenever things in the outside world become too much to handle, this home base of peace and security is always available. Nothing can rob us of this pleasure. This is something to do, not something to study. It is a skill, one that takes patience and time to master. The sensations experienced are described by different people in different ways. To some, it feels like the body and mind are dissolving. Others say it is a kind of intricate unfolding that takes place. Others say that the breath feels like warm energy or even cold as ice moving in the spine. Others again see colors and have visions. None of this is really important. It's a very personal thing. And there's no point in trying to experience something that you've read about. It will happen naturally in its own way in your own time. The trick is to stick to the regular practice every day and keep deepening the feelings of relaxation and expansion. By means of meditation, we can teach our minds to be calm and balanced. Within this calmness is a richness and a potential and inner knowledge which could render our lives boundlessly satisfying and meaningful. While the mind may be what traps us in unhealthy patterns of stress and imbalance, it is also the mind which can free us. Through meditation, we can tap the healing qualities of the mind. Tarthang Tolku Letting Go If we can learn to cultivate a meditative, mindful awareness of our own desires, passions, and attachments, we gain the ability to let go. By simply allowing feelings within as to be as they are, without constantly fighting, resisting, or worrying, we can start to build a steady, solid, inward peace. We start to gain our own insights into the nature of these feelings, into the origin of suffering and desire, and we can start to lay them aside. How do we learn to let go? By simply leaving things as they are without constantly trying to control them, annihilate them, or fight them off. By letting go of our inner judgments, complaints, and grudges, we add peace to our lives. A story from the Zen Buddhist tradition illustrates this perfectly. In a forest monastery, a full day's journey from the nearest village, lived a Buddhist master and his students. The seasons were changing, and the master told some of his students to prepare for a trip to the village to trade for some supplies they needed. Everything was prepared, and they set off. Coming to the banks of a river, they noticed a woman who was unable to cross the rapidly flowing waters on her own. Now, this created a difficult situation for the students. One of the rules or precepts of joining the monastery was to have no physical contact with a woman. The rule was to safeguard the spiritual development of the impressionable young monks. However, another important part of their teaching, like any branch of Buddhism, is the idea of extending kindness to all people and creatures and being helpful whenever possible. The woman clearly needed their help to cross, but none of the students felt comfortable helping her. They offered to carry her baggage across, but that is as far as they would go. Making a chain, they began to cross the dangerous waters. They saw their master do something very unexpected. He picked up the woman and crossed the river with her on his shoulders. Reaching the opposite bank, he set her down again graciously, accepting her thanks, and the monks continued on their journey. The master noticed one student in particular who seemed upset, but said nothing as they walked on mile after mile. Finally, they all reached the village and found a shed where they could spend the night. The master approached the young student and asked him what was making him so unhappy. The young monk gradually replied, Master, I have kept silent out of respect for you, but my heart is heavy because of what you did at the river. We are not permitted to touch any woman yet you carried this woman on your shoulders. The master looked at his young student and laughed. What a heavy load you have been carrying all these miles, he said. I set the woman down on the riverbank, but you have been carrying her all this time. In other words, it is more important to maintain inner peace by letting go of negative judgments than to carefully observe each and every rule and instruction. The point is, if you're carrying a heavy psychological burden around with you all the time, why not simply set it down? 
letting go is not the same as getting rid of or throwing away our standards and our better judgment. It is about letting go of our inner conflicts surrounding things. Perhaps there's a particular person that makes you unhappy. You try not to become unhappy around this person, but the more you try, the worse it seems to get. This person just gets under your skin and annoys you and makes you feel terrible. How do you let go of something like that? The idea is to accept the feelings that are within you by simply observing them. How interesting I am feeling like this. At this point, you get a window of opportunity. By being aware of the feelings in you without regretting or judging the feeling, you can decide to simply let it pass, to set it down, and to move on. You don't want to keep wallowing in the anger, frustration, and negativity. You accept that you feel the way you do and simply disconnect from your oh-so-personal indulgence in the mood. Just let it be. If you're quick enough to catch the initial reaction before you're swept along by the inevitable train of associations and thoughts, you are able to change things. These moments are opportunities for enlightenment. In that brief moment, if you are diligent in being aware of how things are connected, you are able to notice how a simple thought becomes charged with emotional energy. This is your own doing, and by becoming mindful or aware of what you are doing, you can change. Instead of wasting your valuable emotional energy on anger and frustration, you are able to free up all that same energy to use productively. It might well flood you with feelings of peace and insight. Samadhi. The idea of samadhi is not unique to Buddhism. It can be found outside Buddhism in religions such as Hinduism, Sikhism, and Jainism. All these variations point to a common concept, a completely concentrated, single-pointed kind of state of mind. In Buddhism, this is the eighth and final element of the Noble Eightfold Way. Samadhi is the goal of meditation and the ultimate state pointed to by the Buddha. During his meditation under the Bodhi tree, he penetrated into the deepest state of peace and tranquility, a point where the intellectual mind no longer interferes with direct awareness. In our normal day-to-day lives, we go through various mental states. Ranging from deep, dreamless sleep and climbing the ladder of awareness, we reach states of mind where we are completely absorbed in higher intellectual thought. Most of us don't question these states of mind and are not aware that the range of mental states extend far beyond what we are used to. During deep meditation, it is possible to transcend our normal state of mind and become completely absorbed inwardly. This gives rise to completely new experiences. As human beings, we are formed in a certain way, and we need certain basic things in order to live. Normally, we think of water, food, and air as the basic nutrients to survive, but there is more. The mind needs a kind of food, too. Without constant stimulation from sense impressions, the mind can become deranged. Scientific experiments where people spend time in black rooms, where all sense stimulation is inhibited, there are no sights, sounds, smells, or any other sense objects, have confirmed that after a certain amount of time, a kind of paranoia sets in. Our minds need to constantly digest sensory input. With meditation, the beam of attention is turned inward, and instead of leading to abnormal mental states, anxiety, or paranoia, it leads to the opposite, tranquil balance of the mind. During samadhi, the mind is completely centered, unified, and harmonious. There is no more inner division. The whole being, all attention, and all aspects of the mind are unified into a single wholesome activity aimed at raising the level of consciousness to a pure state. It is sometimes compared to a lake with a perfectly calm, reflective surface rather than one that is disturbed by the motion of waves on the surface. To reach a state of such utter absorption takes time and practice. Some of us are more skilled than others in meditation, but a little experimentation into it will show you just how tricky our minds can be. No sooner have we sat down in meditation than the mind starts to throw up all kinds of distractions. We begin thinking about our bodies or things we need to do. We become restless, bored, or tired. The Buddha explained a series of stages that one passes through on the path to samadhi. Initially, meditation leads to a deep, relaxed kind of peace. But this is not the end, merely the beginning. 
there are various jhanas, or stepping stones, along the way. Buddhist literature goes into great detail about each stage, showing how each one progresses towards the ultimate goal. Meditation is a perfectly natural thing. Many people enter a kind of meditation when involved in activities such as creating or painting or running a race. All thought comes to a single point, accomplishing the task at hand. The difference is that these activities are directed outward toward regular mundane activities. When the same intense concentration is focused inwardly, the results are very different. Data Rashi, a Zen master, described the experience as follows. In absolute samadhi, in complete falling away of body and mind, there is no reflection and no recollection. In a sense, there is no experience, because there is a complete merging of subject and object, or a perfect recognition of already existing non-separation. There is no way of describing what is or was going on. This is the problem that teachers of meditation face when trying to describe the ultimate goal. The experience goes far beyond words and needs to be experienced to be understood. A skillful guide will show you the way, but the rest is up to you. There are many forms of meditation, including different objects to focus on, chanting, mantras, and breath and body techniques. These are all different pathways that lead, one way or another, to the same eventual place, samadhi. What you think, you become. Buddha. Nirvana. Nirvana is not the blowing out of the candle. It is the extinguishing of the flame because day has come. Rabindrana Tagore. What is nirvana? Is it like heaven? Is it an actual place? Nirvana means to extinguish. In Sanskrit, it is spelled nibbana. It could be used in the sense of extinguishing a flame or a fire. What is being extinguished in the Buddha sense is anxiety, fear, restlessness, and struggle. It has nothing to do with heaven, although the experience itself is heavenly. The Dalai Lama defined nirvana as state beyond sorrows or a state of freedom from cyclic existence. Some Westerners have the mistaken idea that nirvana is a kind of nihilism or extinguishing of the self. This isn't exactly right. In fact, it is very difficult to explain exactly what nirvana is using words. Nirvana is a particular state of mind. It isn't an actual physical place at all, and it isn't death or extinguishing the self. The Buddha himself said that anything we might say or imagine about nirvana will be wrong. The only way to know it is to experience it for yourself. Nirvana is beyond space, time, and definition. Whereas Buddhism is an extremely practical and logical way of thought, when it comes to states of mind, logic begins to break down. The Buddha said, The whole world is in flames. By what fire is it kindled? By the fire of lust, hatred, and delusion. By the fire of birth, old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair it is kindled. This is the fire which is extinguished upon reaching nirvana. But how do we know that it exists? Isn't this all just wishful thinking? I have never personally encountered something like nirvana. How can I know there is such a thing? This brings to mind the story of the fish and the turtle. A fish spent all its days swimming in the ocean, doing what fish normally do. One day the fish encountered a strange creature, the turtle. Fascinated by the turtle's weirdness, the fish struck up a conversation with the turtle. One thing led to another, and the turtle started speaking about dry land. The fish wanted to know what this dry land was all about, never having come across anything like it in all its life. The fish inquired, is it wet? To which the turtle, of course, responded, no. The fish asked more and more questions about dry land. Is it soft? Does it have bubbles? Is it salty? Does the light shine through it? And so on and so on. The turtle could not answer any of these questions very intelligently since the fish had nothing to use as a frame of reference. At the end of it all, this fish concluded that either dry land did not exist or that it was nothing. The turtle replied that the fish should think whatever it wanted to and proceeded to make another excursion to the nothing that did not exist. It is the same with the mind. 
a person who has experienced an altered or elevated state of mind will find it extremely difficult to explain it to someone who has never experienced it for himself. In the same way, to a person who has experienced it, words are quite unnecessary. The experience speaks for itself. This is why the main thrust of Buddha's teachings is, come and see for yourself. Nirvana cannot be explained, only experienced. At some point in the meditative experience, regular logic breaks down. People with an artistic dreamy flair are quite comfortable with this fact, while those with more practical logical minds find it hard to appreciate. How can you know something without understanding how you know it? How can knowledge just appear? The Buddha pointed out time and again that speculation on what nirvana actually is will be quite useless. He could only show the way and invite others to see for themselves. If you have ever had an unexplainable sensation and just knew something that was impossible to know, you will have had a glimpse of what we are discussing. If you have ever been filled with joy and appreciation without knowing why, you've had a taste of nirvana. The Buddha pointed out that it is possible to make this state of mind a permanent thing. Reincarnation Greater in battle than man who would conquer a thousand thousand men is he who would conquer just one, himself. Better to conquer yourself than others. When you trained yourself living in constant self-control, neither a Deva, a Gandaba, nor a Mara, banded with Brahmas, could turn that triumph back into defeat. Gotama Buddha One of the most interesting notions in Buddhist thought is the idea of rebirth or reincarnation. This is a bone of contention amongst people with different religious or philosophical views. Atheists will simply point out that there is no evidence to support the idea of any kind of afterlife whatsoever. Hindus will likely say that reincarnation is a fact. Christians believe in an eternal soul which lives again after this life. The best way to approach the subject is by using common sense, and without asking you to believe in anything at all, you cannot verify for yourself. The ultimate truth must satisfy the natural laws of science, which, to be honest, are still not completely understood, as well as the intuitive knowledge in our hearts and minds. Our ideas about death and the afterlife are woven together with our understanding of what life is. To most of us, this is a division of knowledge that is steeped in mystery. Since we cannot directly know what happens after death, the whole subject is open to question. Many religions have different concepts and ways of explaining this inevitable happening. Some claim the existence of an eternal soul, others do not. Some say that we are reborn into countless lives as different creatures, animals, and people. What is the Buddhist view? The Buddhist writings, the accounts of the enlightenment of the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, show that he gained insight or memories of previous lives during this unique experience. He clearly stated that this was to be his final incarnation in a physical body, and that after his death, he would not return to earth again in a human form. Some of the early followers of the Buddha were likewise quoted as having a limited knowledge of their previous lives. In certain branches of Buddhism, these teachings are emphasized more than in others. In Zen Buddhism, for example, the issue of afterlife is seen as quite unimportant. What matters is the here and now, each moment in the present, holds the secret to life. Life is meaningless without death. Death is meaningless without life. The two complement each other as natural polar opposites. The one cannot be understood without the other. As Blaise Pascal said, it is a disease natural to man to believe he possesses the truth. The Buddha considered knowledge about vague metaphorical concepts far less important than knowledge leading to liberation from our own self-created suffering. This is why the great majority of the original Buddhist knowledge core is about the cause of suffering and the path to relief. A great many people from a great many backgrounds have provided the truth about life after death. Buddhists believe that each truth has its relative merits and failings. All truth is relative. You might argue that scientific fact or truth is never relative. However, this is not accurate. The laws of physics operate with certain limits of energy, temperature, and time. Scientists are still struggling to find the universal laws 
that unify Newton's laws of gravity with the realms of the subatomic. Much is yet to be discovered. The point is that certain kinds of knowledge are not easily grasped by means of intellectual mind alone. A certain intuitive genius is required to snap the more subtle laws of existence, whether scientific or not. Our state of mind influences our thinking capability, and in rare moments of insight, the greatest thinkers have come up with the greatest theories about the truth. At other times, we are merely digesting words and facts, trying to make sense of something that doesn't always make sense. This is why Buddha recommended pushing the limits of the mind by means of meditation. He didn't recommend spending hours musing over books that others had written or sitting at the feet of another to gain a few crumbs of knowledge, but argued that each of us is able to approach the ultimate reality by looking within with the right concentration and the right state of mind. All knowledge, all facts, all theories have to be processed and understood by the same tool, our minds. Our minds are subjective things, and they work by making connections between various bits of the truth. The clever intellectual part of our minds can put ideas into the form of words and use these words as bridges, connecting structures to share what we have thought, experienced, and discovered with other minds. But each mind is trapped in its own subjective world and makes sense of these words in its own particular way. The Buddha knew this, and therefore he recommended finding out the truth about life on your own. Painful as it is, it is the only foolproof method. By accepting the teachings of another person, in faith, without questioning, you are denying yourself the opportunity to know yourself. These are valid arguments both for and against the teaching of reincarnation. If we have lived before, why do we not remember? Most of us don't remember much at all beyond our formative years. On the other hand, how does one explain the fact that some people have knowledge about events, people, and things that are simply not logical? Child prodigies who speak multiple languages or have other abilities that they have never been exposed to are phenomena that have no logical explanations and point to some form of reincarnation as the only thing that makes sense. Some characteristics of people may be explained by means of genetic information, things like skin color and eye color are obviously not dependent on reincarnation, but how does one explain some of the following items of pure science? Why does there continue to be such suffering in the world if we are always evolving? Why is there inequality? Why do identical twins develop different characteristics when their DNA is virtually identical and their upbringing is the same? Why do some individuals have such incredible mental, musical, or physical abilities when their parents do not? Why do young children spontaneously develop things like greed, anger, and jealousy? Why do we instinctively like or dislike certain people? Although none of this is meant to prove or disprove the theory in its entirety, it does make sense to consider the idea of rebirth in conjunction with verifiable scientific proof. They need not contradict one another. Science has indeed uncovered a great many of the mysteries related to genomes and the interconnectedness of all species. The truth is, though, that much remains to be discovered. We constantly seem to have more questions than answers. Karma Karma is experience. An experience creates memory. A memory creates imagination and desire, and desire creates karma again. If I buy a cup of coffee, that's karma. I now have the memory that might give me the potential desire for having cappuccino, and I walk into Starbucks, and that's karma all over again. Deepak Chopra What is good or bad karma? Karma, sometimes spelled kama, is the law of moral causation. Mystics and religious figures throughout history continue to point out the fact that what we think about constantly has an effect on our lives and the lives of all living things around us. This is a simple fact. People with continual negative or angry thoughts tend to stir up the lives of all around them. Peaceful people similarly affect us all. The law of action and reaction goes very deep and together with reincarnation forms a large key part of Buddhist thinking. Buddha taught that together with the natural physical law of action and reaction, there is also a more subtle law regulating spiritual life, the life of the mind. 
This is not doctrine as laid out by God or anyone in particular, but is a statement that can be verified by each of us individually, at least as far as this life is concerned. When questioned about the nature of life, the Buddha explained at length that all habitual desires, motivations, and drives within people are what determine the outcomes of their lives. What they desire is what they think about. Thoughts, once incubated, turn into actions and influence all of our choices, our words, and our actions. We only do and say what we feel we need to do and say. We are drawn along in this life by a constant stream of things that need to be done, goals that we feel we need to achieve, or desires that seek expression and fulfillment. The Buddha explained, All living beings have actions, karma, as their own, their inheritance, their inborn cause, their kinsmen, their refuge. It is karma that differentiates beings into low and high states. The Pali term, kama, literally means action, doing something. It is connected with our will. When we desire something, we exercise our willpower to turn the desire into actions in the hope of satisfying that desire. This is the root of all actions. This is why the Buddha had so much to say about awareness or mindfulness. When we become aware of our own drives, our own desires, and our own motivations, we start to become more capable of changing our own core natures. Most of the time, we are asleep in terms of mindfulness. We are so busy going about the business of life that we seldom pay attention to what we actually are trying to accomplish. If we are constantly aware of our inner state and the origin of the impulses that drive us throughout our lives, then we start to develop mastery over our inner world. We can choose to think about or ignore certain drives. We can choose to free ourselves from the cycle of cause and effect. By mind, the world is led. By mind, the world is drawn. And all men own the sovereignty of mind. This is not the teaching that some being sits up on a cloud somewhere and judges every thought or action as either good or bad. There is no pre-selected list of actions that either qualify as good or bad in the moral sense. However, the subtle laws of karma ensure that people who harm others live in a state of mind akin to hell. Since they are intelligent enough to know that their actions have harmed others, the reciprocal effect is experienced in their own inner worlds. Their own ignorance causes them pain. Instead of enjoying natural, warm relationships, their hurtful inclinations will cut them off from peace and karma will ensure that they reap the rewards of their own thoughts and actions. This is a great truth. If you go through life being closed off and angry, you will make things very difficult for yourself. You will experience the fruits of your own choices and your own actions. On the other hand, by constantly being open, loving, and compassionate, you will tend to lead a much happier life. This doesn't guarantee a pain-free life, since we share this planet with many kinds of people, but inwardly, in your own mind, things will be peaceful, rich, and pleasant. Karma is not the same thing as fate or predestination. We still have the ability to choose whether or not to think or do something. In fact, the more aware we become of our own inter-realities, the more freedom we have to actually choose instead of being led along by our own ignorant drives and desires. However, habits are hard things to break. A person who has spent his entire life chasing after material possessions will find it difficult to let go of this craving. Difficult, but not impossible. The key to changing things is becoming more aware of gaining the insight that our thoughts, actions, and our sufferings are all linked together. By stilling the mind through meditation and observing the habit through mindfulness, This insight can be achieved. Once an insight has been seen, it cannot be unseen again. Once we know something, we know for good. The Buddha says, I declare, O Bhikkhus, that volition, intention, is karma. Having willed, one acts by body, speech, and thought. Angatara Nikaya. As we sow, we reap, somewhere and sometime, in his life or in a future birth. What we reap today is what we have sown, either in the present or in the past. The Samyutti Nikaya states, 
according to the seed that's sown, so is the fruit you reap therefrom. Doer of good will gather good, doer of evil, evil reaps. Down is the seed, and thou shalt taste the fruit thereof. Christians will recognize this concept from the teachings of Jesus. Islam, too, shows how a person's inner attitude translates into the fruits of words and deeds, and how this affects one. Where Buddhism differs from these two forms of religion is that instead of pointing to an omniscient being who weighs upon our actions and judges us, we ourselves are the creators of our own personal hell or our own personal heaven. Since we are the architects of our own fate, our own happiness or misery, there is no one to bear the burden for us. We ourselves must strive to overcome our own karma. This can be seen every day in any place. Some people go through life as if weighed down by incredible weight. They seldom smile and always notice the negative aspects of things. Others go through life more happily and a smile is never far away. Both kinds of people experience the inevitable strains and difficulties in life, but their approach to life is completely different, and it shows. Today, psychology is more open than ever before to this kind of idea. Although psychologists do not learn about or teach karma or reincarnation, it is now a widely accepted view that we all create our own destinies and inner circumstances. Of course, each of us needs to make up his or her own mind. Once again, nothing should be blindly believed, but rather we should investigate the truths of all things before accepting or rejecting them. Dharma. The word dharma is often used in Buddhism. What does it mean? It comes from the ancient religions in India and is found in other religions such as Hinduism and Jainism too. Originally, it meant something like the natural law. It can mean different things depending on how it is used, including the state of nature, the cosmos as it is, laws of nature, the teachings of the Buddha or explanations of natural law that he unfolded, a phenomena with its naturally lawful properties. According to the Theravdin monk and scholar Wapola Rahula, there is no term in Buddhist terminology wider than Dharma. It includes not only the conditioned things and states, but also the non-conditioned, the absolute nirvana. There is nothing in the universe or outside, good or bad, conditioned or non-conditioned, relative or absolute, which is not included in this term. What the Buddha Taught, Grove Press, 1974, page 58. Dharma points to the nature of things as they are, and once freed from the delusions of ignorance and misunderstanding, these truths are evident to all who want to know. In a way, it means the opposite of speculative theory. You don't have to believe in the Dharma. It simply is the way it is. Faith forms no part of it. This is what makes Buddhism so appealing to the scientifically oriented. If something the Buddha said seems like nonsense or utterly wrong, you are always free to disagree. It is your right. There is no problem with that. Of course, it makes not even the slightest difference to things as they are. When all dharmas are empty, what is endless? What has an end? What is endless and with an end? What is not endless and not with an end? What is it? What is other? What is permanent? What is impermanent? What is impermanent and permanent? What is neither? Nagarjuna. All this points to the mind as the source of the truth about anything at all. Truth is a concept, a mental construction. Mathematical and scientific truths are not open to debate. They simply exist. The truth about the mind is far more subtle, but equally self-evident, provided you have the mental tools to appreciate them. This is why the word dharma refers at the same time to natural laws and the teachings of Buddha. He rediscovered these subtle insights, leading to a deep understanding of how all relative concepts fit together and how the intellectual mind continually interprets and separates things into individual things. This appearance of individuality is deceptive and is a cause for confusion and delusion. The Buddha's teachings are aimed at bringing people to their own realization of this, and in doing so, their entire lives are changed 
to be more harmonious with the internal dharma. Dharma means the fact that we are co-creators of our own personal realities. It refers to mental objects or thoughts. While the entire natural world is controlled by the basic laws of nature, our minds interact with these physical things in a very subtle way. This is also subject to dharma or natural law. It is linked to the ideas about karma and reincarnation, in the sense that all our mental activities influence everything else. In our own minds, we hold the power to change the nature of our own personal worlds. Dharma is also used to refer to the ethical standards found in Buddhism, including compassion, right action, and thoughts, and all the rest. Reality is all-encompassing. The absolute nature is one. Although we may feel separate from the original uncreated reality, whether we call it God, peak experience, or enlightened mind, through awareness we can contact this essential part of ourselves, Tarthang Tolku, mindfulness. In Asian languages, the word for mind and the word for heart are the same. So if you're not hearing mindfulness in some deep way as heartfulness, you're not really understanding it. Compassion and kindness towards oneself are intrinsically woven into it. You could think of mindfulness as wise and affectionate attention. John Kabat-Zinn We have already touched on the idea of mindfulness, but since it is such an important concept and central to Buddhist thought, let's take a deeper look at it. The Pali word for mindfulness is sati, and in Sanskrit it's smirti. These words carry the meaning of alertness, recollection, or retention. It means being completely focused on the present moment, fully present, and not divided, daydreaming, or worrying. The Four Noble Truths about suffering and its cause, as well as its solution, are directly related to mindfulness. It is our habit of attaching emotional and mental judgments that creates this delusion, this sorrow, and this suffering. By being mindful of our own relationship to reality, to the way that we constantly create our own inner worlds, we are able to nip the habit in the bud. Being mindful means accepting each moment as it is without judgment, without involvement, without constantly wishing things were different. Normally we go through life with a subtle, almost invisible interpreter inside us. Each experience is immediately analyzed, either liked or disliked. On very rare moments, we catch ourselves simply savoring the experience without anything extra. These are peak experiences where the whole world suddenly seems so full of meaning that we can hardly believe we didn't notice it before. At these moments, the heart is open and intuition works in harmony with the intellect. Most of us know movements like these. Sometimes when we go away on vacation and we can totally relax, everything seems to take on a new appearance. Sunsets are more interesting and beautiful. Food tastes better and people just seem friendlier. Troubles seem less important, and life seems worthwhile. This is because part of our mental culture that is so conditioned to interpret everything is momentarily switched off. We are experiencing a life in a natural, simple, and good way. It is direct and full of good energy. At other times, life seems quite different. When our internal energies are being drained by worry, anxiety, and a restless mind, our troubles seem to increase in intensity and complexity. Everything becomes dreary, thankless task, and life seems void of meaning. By considering this kind of phenomenon objectively, you will realize that the world has always been exactly the same. What has changed is something internal, our mental landscape. The Buddha came to this realization some 2,500 years ago, and today psychology has started to realize the usefulness of this insight. Positive things happen to positive people. Three fundamentals of mindfulness. One, mindfulness brings us to the present moment. Whether we are driving, talking, washing dishes, or making tea, whatever we are doing becomes very deliberate, conscientious, and full of importance. When you wash dishes mindfully, you are careful, thorough, and efficient. Your mind isn't off dreaming about tomorrow or thinking about something else. Suddenly, washing dishes becomes very, very meaningful. It might even turn into a symphony of soap suds and water. Two, if we are mindful, we see things as they are. When we are distracted, we project our own inner sensations into things and delude ourselves into believing 
that they are either good or bad. Someone might look at us with some expression or other, possibly deep in thought or for whatever reason. If we are feeling insecure and our mind is off on a tangent, thinking about all our shortcomings and failings, suddenly the expression on that face becomes menacing. Why is he looking at me that way? What did I ever do to him, we might think. The truth is that he isn't thinking about us at all, but we attach this meaning to the innocent facial expression. With mindfulness, we start to free ourselves from our own foolishness. We simply accept things the way they are, without bothering about whether we, they, or the circumstances mean this or that. What an interesting facial expression. Odd. Moving on. When we are mindful, we remember that everything is temporary. Instead of overreacting about each small tribulation and problem, we simply get on with the practicalities of life as best we can. Things become simpler, easier, and more manageable. We know that problems won't last forever, so we don't wear ourselves out thinking about the possibilities. We know that good fortune also doesn't last, and so we don't concern ourselves too much with our ego, our accomplishments, or what others think of us. We learn to flow with the present moment and don't waste time wishing things were different. Soon enough, they will be, whatever happens, and that will be all right. Mindfulness includes awareness of our bodies, too. Many of us have developed bad postures and unhealthy physical habits simply because we have failed to pay attention to our own bodies. Today's dominant culture is a culture of the mind. We are constantly reading, watching, thinking, and forming opinions. There is much to learn, and knowledge is power. All of this means that many of us don't pay enough attention to our bodies. By spending time sitting in meditation, paying attention to physical sensations, we get back in touch with our natural physical equilibrium, improving heart rate, circulation, and much more besides. Many of the troubles in our lives arise when we feel uneasy. Somewhere in the back of our minds, we are aware that something is missing or wrong, but we assign the fault to outside circumstances. By making the mind quiet and paying attention to these inner sensations, we gain balance and we deal with the trouble directly instead of complicating matters. In the same way, if we pay proper attention to our feelings, to our emotions, we enjoy a more fulfilling life. In a business environment or in a day-to-day work, it might not be desirable to be an emotional sort of person. We tend to cut ourselves off from our feelings, and much of the day is spent in a kind of autopilot mode. We lose touch with our own inner world, and the result is a sense of distracted emptiness. Life seems empty and hollow. When the emotions are allowed to come out, it often turns into an outburst or a bit of a breakdown. Being mindful of feelings means accepting our emotions for what they are, without suppressing them or fighting them. This leads to balance and isn't the same thing as indulging in every whim or being highly emotional. Simply paying attention to the feelings within us, we are able to deal with one thing at a time as it comes up and not build up a deep, resentful, or anxious feeling inside. All things are connected. The infinite vibratory levels, the dimensions of interconnectedness are without end. There is nothing independent. All beings and things are residents in your awareness. Alex Gray Another key facet common to virtually all Buddhist thinking is the idea of dependent arising. This is a subtle idea and has been translated into English from the words Panika Samupada or Padika Samupada. It is sometimes translated into our language differently. For example, independent arising. Although the words seem complicated, the idea is this. All beings and things are interdependent. Nothing exists on its own, but rather forms a part of a whole. Because one thing exists, another thing exists. The Buddha left no metaphysical explanations regarding creation, evolution, or the original cause of things, but showed that everything in the entire cosmos is dependent on everything else. The whole show fits together and one part cannot exist without another. He spoke about cause and effect, and to use his words, when this is, that is. This arising, that arises. When this is, that is. This arising, that arises. When this is not, 
that is not. This ceasing, that ceases. In a way, he was speaking about the theory of relativity, though not in strictly scientific terms. He was saying that all things are dependent on each other for existence. Every phenomenon, natural law, and every living creature arises or exists because the conditions supporting this existence are already there. For example, children are born because their parents exist, and they procreate. Old age and sickness exist because youth and health exist. Light exists because darkness exists. Things only exist in relationship to other things. Nothing exists in isolation. Energy, matter, and time are all relative and depend on each other. When searching out the meaning of life, this concept is one of the most important. Together with the ideas connected with reincarnation and karma, the Buddha taught, through ignorance are conditioned volitional actions or kama formations. Through volitional actions is conditioned consciousness. Through consciousness are conditioned mental and physical phenomena. Through mental and physical phenomena are conditioned the six faculties, i.e. five physical sense organs and mind. Through the six faculties is conditioned sensorial and mental contact. Through sensorial and mental contact is conditioned sensation. Through sensation is conditioned desire, thirst. Through desire, thirst, is conditioned clinging. Through clinging is conditioned the process of becoming. Through the process of becoming is conditioned birth. Through birth are conditioned decay, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. In other words, one thing follows after another. We find ourselves in this world with this consciousness, thinking these thoughts and feeling these emotions because everything is interdependent. The aim of meditation and mindfulness is to break through the veil that separates us from this realization. Reading the Buddha's words without having this insight can only point you in the direction. You need to realize this for yourself. Individuals who have had access to this direct realization report feelings of intense relief, of letting go, and of realizing a greater truth. Trivial worries and fears are dissolved, and the realization that we are just a small part of a big ocean of life puts things into perspective. The mountains of problems seem more like mole heaps, and the worries and self-sabotaging tendencies within are dropped. It is a return to the natural state of affairs, and joy of each moment is allowed to exist as it is, without wishing for things to be different, and without wishing it was yesterday or tomorrow. Impermanence The Buddha did not teach the existence of an immortal soul, but rather that everything is impermanent. He further taught that our concept of an individual self is based on delusion and wishful thinking. What we think of as the self is a temporary arrangement of conditions that make our self possible. Impermanence is the essence of our human condition. Nations rise and fall, leaders come and go, systems change, and what is acceptable today is unacceptable tomorrow. Everyone knows that death is inevitable, but most people fear it anyway. We need to face up to reality, though. Impermanence and death are integral parts of being alive. It is important that we take advantage of the fact that we are alive. A humble and wise Buddhist teacher, Tarthang Tulku, from Tibet, wrote, People are willing to go to war and even give up their lives for a cause, but they cannot give up the causes of their suffering. It is mysterious how certain psychological functions dominate us so strongly that we cannot give them up, even when we understand intellectually the pain they carry with them. If we remain aware of the fact that we are going to die without morbidly fixating on it, it provides a kind of energy in our lives to accomplish what we need to do. It helps us to maintain balance and keep an even keel. When faced with difficult, stressful conditions, if we remember that everything is temporary, we will continue to try hard and do our best, but not be overly worried about the final outcome. The truth about knowledge is that, as a species in general, we know far less than what we don't know. 
This is even truer of us as individuals. The range of our understanding is truly limited. Although we have made great strides in the realms of science and technology, our basic understanding of reality is still very much open to questions. There are far more questions unanswered than the ones we have answers to. If you consider the history of mankind honestly and fairly, you will realize that a great many people have tried to understand the eternal questions of life and death, meaning, and the ultimate nature of reality. Some of these people were truly remarkable, insightful, and intelligent, and some less so. Not all of them could be right, and not all of them could be wrong. The truth lies somewhere in between all the various points of view, lying just beyond them, calling us on to investigate further. Each one's point of view is relatively accurate, but never completely true. The truth is always a relative thing. If we start out from a point of complete honesty, taking note of the few things that we know to be absolutely true, and testing each new thought with our minds and against our own experience, this will eventually lead us to true knowledge. Simply accepting the views of others will never truly satisfy us. The things that keep us from discovering the truth are our own ignorance and our fears. We don't want to appear ignorant in the eyes of others, who are just as ignorant, so we cover our feelings and our shortcomings in their company. Worse than that, we hide this fact from ourselves. Whenever the important questions in life come up, we gloss over the subject refusing to face things head on. We repeat the words of others, or we dig in our heels and get set for an argument. One part of us knows that facing these questions will lead to a change. This is what we want to avoid. As painful as our existence might be, it's all we know, and we don't want to give up what we have, meager as it may be, in exchange for the unknown. On an academic or mental level, we accept that everything is impermanent, including us, but this doesn't translate into the courage we need to actually make the change. What will people think? What will they say about it? So we continue day after day. We crave a little bit of peace and comfort, some stability, and a little pleasure in life. We exhaust our energies chasing after these pipe dreams, never fully, honestly facing up to the facts. This very same craving for excitement and peace is what is causing our suffering. The story of the Monkey King illustrates this point. Once there was a Monkey King, and one night he saw the most beautiful thing, the reflection of the moon in a deep pond. He craved it, and he desired it. Night after night he would sit in the branches of a tree overhanging the pond and stare at the beautiful sight. He made up his mind that it would be his. So he gathered together all the finest and strongest monkeys, and they deliberated on how to go about catching the moon. They decided to hang from the tree, one monkey holding on to the next, and form a chain down to the surface of the water where the king would simply pluck the glimmering jewel out of the water. So this is what they did. One after the other, they dangled from the branches above until the weight of all the monkeys proved too much for the one holding onto the branch, and they all fell into the water and drowned. It is the same with us sometimes. We know that chasing after the dream will lead to pain and suffering, but like foolish monkeys, we go ahead anyway. Making the decision to seek out the ultimate nature of reality for ourselves means taking on the responsibility for our own lives. There is no Savior to do it for us. We alone must persevere and take the weight upon our own shoulders. Our emotions hold great power within them. They are what drive us to act. We might make up our minds one way or another, but without emotional impetus, our thoughts remain just thoughts. When we feel that we must do something, then we do it. Our minds and emotions tend to be very confused and often work at cross-purposes. One part of us may know that our habits are harmful, yet we are unable to change these habits. Something inside us clings to them, unwilling to let go. Eventually, this self-division leads to a state of complete exhaustion, and we simply become indifferent to everything. We don't care anymore. The first noble truth of Buddhism points to this fact. With ignorance comes suffering, not bliss. 
while our inner worlds are in disharmony due to ignorance or simply from the habit of not paying attention, suffering is sure to follow. This is why inner awareness is so important. It leads to an acceptance of our circumstances and shows us a way out. By understanding the temporary nature of all things, we start to become free. The self. Because we were born, have a body, and follow the way of all life, we imagine that we own a unique, permanent thing called the self. However, this self is like a drop of water in the ocean. The drop has no meaning if there is no ocean. In the same way, our selves have no meaning without the relationship to the vast sea of human life. Instead of a permanent feature, our selves consist of five skandhas, or collections of things. One, form. Two, sensation. Three, perception. Four, mental formations. Five, consciousness. None of these elements is permanent, but all are subject to change. This idea is referred to as an admin. A little honest personal reflection will show that this is true. None of us is the same person we were when we were just born. We undergo changes throughout life, both in body and in mind. We outgrow certain habits and form new ones. We gain new insights and drop old beliefs along the way. Much of our personality is borrowed and copied from others, our family, friends, and our heroes. So what does this mean practically? If there is no true self, then who is reading this sentence and who wrote it? Instead of getting tangled up in a philosophical debate, we use the words me and you, I, them, he, and she. We all understand what these words mean. These concepts only make sense in relation to each other. They are defined by one another. The Buddha refused to answer certain questions relating to this teaching, pointing out that it was pointless speculation. If what he said did not help lead people along the path to enlightenment, then he would rather remain silent, knowing that words are often inadequate to describe subtle truths and that people have a tendency to get stuck on the interpretation of words, leading them into a tangled mess of contradictions. In life, we form a complex relationship with our selves. We all have many aspects of our personalities. Some of us are more stable than others. Different sides of us appear under stressful conditions. Certain people bring out the best in us. Others bring out the worst. The teenage years are particularly important in terms of this inner relationship. Self-doubt and insecurities that creep in during our formative years can cause suffering throughout our entire lives. Buddhists try to attain a state of non-identification with the self. This does not mean that Buddhists are morbidly depressed or suicidal. On the contrary, letting go of all imaginary aspects related to self-identification allows us to become natural, simple, and content. Instead of chasing after illusory dreams of the kinds of people we want to become, the things we want to own, and power we want to command, we simply accept the here and the now and get on with things as best we can. Others might judge us and decide who or what we are, but inwardly we become free. Every moment is new, every moment we die in terms of our old selves and are reborn anew. Anything is possible. At this point, the idea of the self disappears entirely. Thoughts themselves are the thinkers. Deeds themselves are the doers. And we are once again part of the vast ocean of life, changing at every moment. Gone are the worries about whether or not we are good enough by anyone's standards. Once this state of mind is experienced, you will see for yourself the value of leading a simple, honest life. Giving up the self does not lead to criminal mentality or social pathology. Instead, feelings of compassion and connectedness to all things rise up naturally. There is no more wanting, no more lacking. Each creature becomes an extension of the self. So why harm them? Women in Buddhism. What is the appropriate behavior for a man or a woman in the midst of this world where each person is clinging to his piece of debris? What's the proper salutation between people as they pass each other in this flood? Buddha. 
For many centuries, there has been discrimination against women in many parts of the world, including those where Buddhism first started. What does Buddhism say about the status of women? In ancient India, women were not viewed as equal to men. As children, they were under the protection of parents until married, and then came under the control of their husbands. If they were in a position of being a second or third wife, their position was even worse. In some places, they were seen as being on par with the lowest caste, the sudras. Women were seen as being fit for domestic duties only, raising children and taking care of the household. There was often little or no opportunity to educate themselves. Education was often seen as being unfit for women. When a woman became pregnant, the family hoped for a boy. Some of this sentiment was expressed in various parts of Buddhist teachings, given the environment that it developed in. Different schools of Buddhism variously accept or reject certain ancient documents or scriptures, and some of these texts deal with the issue of sexism. The Buddha himself, though, harbored no such feelings of discrimination. When first asked whether or not women should be allowed to follow him as devotees, the Buddha knew that this would cause problems because of the cultural dominant in that place at that time. He first refused women, but later changed his mind when he saw that there were some women who would benefit deeply from following his teachings, despite the problems they would face. The story developed as follows. Pashapati Gautami was the Buddha's foster mother, his deceased mother's sister. She loved the young boy in her charge very dearly and was most upset when he decided to leave the family to further his spiritual pursuits. Both she and the Buddha's biological father, the king, were eventually deeply moved by the teachings of their son and followed his every word. She approached him one day to ask permission to become his follower, to which he refused three times in all. Dejected and disappointed, she returned home, but she never gave up. She was joined by 500 maidens who also felt the urge to seek ordination amongst the followers of this remarkable man. So they made a plan. They shaved their heads and donned the yellow robes of the monks and set off to catch up with the Buddha. They walked more than 350 miles and caused quite a commotion as they went. Crowds lined the dusty roads as they passed through each village. They stuck to their mission and eventually found their way to the Jetavana Monastery, where the Buddha was then staying. They were met at the entrance by the Venerable Ananda, chief disciple of the Buddha. Taking compassion on these courageous women, Ananda approached the Buddha to beg him to allow women to join his followers. Finally, he agreed, but stipulated eight conditions to their acceptance. Note. A bhikkhu is a male Buddhist monk. A bhikkhuni is a female Buddhist nun. 1. A bhikkhuni, even if she was in the order for 100 years, must respect a bhikkhu even of a day's standing. 2. A bhikkhuni should reside within six hours' traveling distance to and from the monastery where bhikkhus reside for advice. 3. On observance days, a bhikkhuni should consult the bhikkhus. 4. A bhikkhuni should spend the vasa, rains retreat, under the orders of both bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. 5. A bhikkhuni should ply her life by both the orders. 6. A bhikkhuni should, on two years, obtain the higher ordination of a sampatha of both orders. 7. A bhikkhuni cannot scold a bhikkhu. 8. A bhikkhuni cannot advise a bhikkhu, rather it should be the other way about. To the Buddha, the difference between men and women was merely a practical one. It had nothing to do with merit. Both were equally capable of realizing the truth about what he taught. However, he was a very practical man and knew there would be friction over his decision because of the dominant social culture. His rules for his followers were aimed at making things easier for all and maintaining order and focus on the essential teachings leading to liberation. This was always the important thing, and the details were not so much rules and regulations as advice on how to live peacefully, happily, and in an organized way. He gave wise counsel to men and women in the family situation, admonishing both to see the merits of the other. He counseled men to love their wives and to honor them for the vital role they play 
in the family as nurturer and educator. He advised a wife to respect her husband and to learn how to stand in for him when he had to be away or was indisposed. In this way, he could form a practical, balanced partnership to take care of the needs of the family. Neither husband nor wife was more important than the other. Of course, it would take many years for this kind of equality to start to take root in society. Traditions and cultural heritage runs deep, and people are slow to change. In certain adaptations of Buddhism, for example, the Pure Land School, popular in Kashmir and Central Asia, it is stated that women first need to be reborn as men to attain enlightenment. Many Buddhist texts, on the other hand, document the lives and achievements of remarkable women, including the Chinese Buddhist Liao Tima, called the Iron Grindstone, Moshan, and Miao Jin. In acquiring the Dharma, all acquire the Dharma equally. All should pay homage to and hold in esteem one who has acquired the Dharma. Do not make an issue of whether it is a man or a woman. This is the most wondrous law of the Buddha Dharma. Ai Hai Dogen, 1200-1253. Other notable women in Buddhist literature include Sister Kima and Sister Saba, both of whom showed great wisdom and compassion and attained final enlightenment. In most westernized schools of Buddhism today, the gender issue is a non-issue. The teachings of the Buddha point out that all states of existence are equally beneficial and equally temporary. What is important are not the outward things, the body, the family, or the status in life, but the internal things the mind, the state of the mind. The old paradigm of men versus women is falling away, slowly but surely, though in many parts of the world, women still live in extremely difficult conditions. Like all other forms of suffering, Buddhism aims to go directly to the root of the cause. Practical Buddhism in Daily Life Every kind of work can be a pleasure. Even simple household tasks can be an opportunity to exercise and expand our caring, our effectiveness, our responsiveness. As we respond with caring and vision to all work, we develop our capacity to respond fully to all of life. Every action generates positive energy, which can be shared with others. These qualities of caring and responsiveness are the greatest gift we can offer. Tarthang Tulku so far, we have looked at the history and development of Buddhist ideas, and we have considered the most important concepts, including meditation, mindfulness, happiness, and different states of mind. But what does it mean to be a Buddhist in everyday life? How does all this mindfulness and meditation fit into the realities of living in the world at this time? Each moment in each and every day offers an opportunity to improve our inner mental worlds. The door is always open, and all it takes is a particular kind of attention. Now, this might seem perfectly straightforward, but if you honestly try to develop this attention, you will come to know the nature of the problem for yourself. As we have seen, all of us go through different states of mind each day. Scientists studying the brain have identified certain frequencies, ranging from lower to higher frequencies, that correspond to our different states of mind. When we are in a deep, dreamless sleep, our frequencies tend to be low. But when we dream, they change. During our normal wakeful awareness, beta state, they are cycling between 14 and 30 cycles per second, and this gives rise to the regular experience of being awake and active. As we concentrate more and more, they quicken. And during sleep meditation, we are able to access theta and even delta states of awareness. This is very rare and comes with a whole new experience of life. Practically, though, we are more interested in being happy than in experiencing altered states of mind. This is where the idea of mindfulness comes in. This mindfulness starts out during our simple meditative practice, but it must eventually become a fixed element in our state of mind, our level of awareness, or our brain frequencies. We are not meant to go through life in a vague dream reacting to one stimulus after the next, but rather we are meant to be the architects of our own lives. We are meant to wake up and realize that we create the reality within us. This takes dedication. Of course, there are always things happening around us that we have no control over. The world is a complex place, 
and the challenges we face are endless. We need to eat and provide for the basic necessities of life. Things are always changing, so we need to constantly adapt to new things. Once we have come to the realization that our minds are far more powerful than we give them credit for, things begin to change inwardly. We start to become unchained from our negative emotions, though they still exist. We do not continue to wallow in misery. We can extend this understanding into every situation we face in life because we are mindful. Our confidence and our sense of balance tends to become solid and unbreakable. We can start to maintain a constant open feeling toward the experiences we go through at each moment of the day. Real life offers the opportunity to test our skills in remaining aware. It is one thing to experience the bliss of pure awareness during meditation. It is quite another matter to hold on to this peace when we have to face a busy, challenging day. Every activity and every interaction with other people tends to draw us away from this internal peace. It is a common thing for Buddhists who regularly practice meditation, or for anyone at all, whether Buddhist or not, to reach a point where they question the usefulness of their meditation practice. Is it really worth it? It takes tenacity to remain awake, and it is easy to slip back into the slumber of ignorance. Eventually, though, the pain and emptiness of such sleepy existence will shake us awake again and force us to question our methods. Gradually, over time, a mindful, alert state of mind becomes second nature. We gain confidence in our inner guide. We trust our instincts and we let go of persistent negative patterns of behavior. The mind returns to a natural state where everything is harmonious, acceptable, and open. In this way, we become better people. Meditation is not about seeing visions or achieving mental superpowers. It is about becoming free from our own unnatural points of view, from rigid, harmful patterns of thought, and opening the mind to new insights. Developing mindfulness is not about escaping the world into a dreamy comfort zone. It is not about building a fortress in the mind to filter out painful experiences. Rather, it accepts all experiences without judging or labeling them, without trying to change them, ignore them, or push them away. In this way, our minds and hearts become free. We learn to flow with a constant change, never regretting anything and never getting swept away by our own confusion. Once we learn to love and accept ourselves, morality will naturally follow. Instead of following rules and regulations as laid down in some book, on a tablet, or in a collection of laws, our own sense of peace and tranquility will guide us to the right way to live. We will begin to see the negative emotional effects of theft, greed, anger, and unfairness. We will naturally want to treat others well because we are filled with compassion. No one needs to instruct us anymore. It becomes self-evident. The Buddha counseled his followers who were on the path to self-development and enlightenment to be generous and compassionate. He knew that, like most of us, they were still caught up in ignorance and mental sleep. In fact, having an open heart and a pure, clean inner state is a prerequisite for enlightenment. Weighed down by guilt and negativity, we can never truly progress out of the morass of human suffering. Once we are natural, pure, and open, we can begin to enjoy the fruits of our efforts. The law of karma is operating at all time in each moment. Our thoughts, feelings, and actions are all linked, and these elements are also linked to the causal effects of our actions. What we think, say, and do influences the world, and we are influenced in return, since all things are connected. Even if one gets away with murder in this life, the law of karma ensures that inwardly the effects are felt. This is why Buddha laid down some basic guidelines for his followers to refrain from taking life, not to steal, to avoid sexual misconduct, to refrain from lies and false speech, to avoid intoxicants. This is the concept of virtue, sila, which is basic to Buddhism. These are not the commandments of the Old Testament and the Bible. You are always free to disregard any or all of them, but doing so will lead to unhappiness. Living a simple, honest life will free your heart and mind from the burdens of regret and shame, from guilt and worry. 
If you've done your best to treat others as kindly and as fairly as you could, you will be blessed with a calm heart and peaceful sleep. As individuals and as a society, we can only benefit from this. Realistically and practically, not one of us is able to solve all of the world's problems. What we can do, though, is to look to ourselves. Once we realize that we are responsible for our thoughts, we are able to start changing our own personal worlds. As children, there comes a point when we realize that our thoughts are private and cannot be seen by our mothers and fathers. As we grow and develop mentally, we all create a particular relationship between our inner thoughts and our outward actions. There is a kind of subterfuge at work. Outwardly, we smile and nod, but inwardly, we might be cursing someone. This habit becomes so entrenched that we aren't even aware of it anymore. When we realize that our minds are germinating seeds of unhappiness within us, through mindful awareness of our inner workings, we start to realize that the thoughts we hold do indeed become visible outwardly. Our frustrations will come out one way or another, and more often than not, the victim is innocent. We might take out our anger on our loved ones, for example, who had nothing to do with the crimes of the person we are actually angry with. Practical Buddhism affects our inner worlds far more than the outer world. Gradually, we develop peace, equanimity, and happiness. This is where the teachings of Buddha start to transform our outer worlds, too. Instead of adding to the woes of the world, we become sources of comfort and guidance to our fellow sufferers in this life. By following the practical guidelines of Buddhism, we become better people in every respect. We can become better husbands or wives by becoming aware of the suffering that our spouse is experiencing and having compassion. Simple things no longer need to lead to arguments, further increasing the pain in life. Instead, we can become a source of balance and comfort. We can be better parents by teaching our children to gradually become more mindful and compassionate. Instead of holding up impossible standards for them to conform to in order to please us, we can show them that a happy life depends on a happy mind. We can teach them to get in touch with their own source of happiness from deep within. Besides providing for their physical needs, we can give them an unshakable confidence in the natural goodness of life and instill peace deep in their hearts. Meditation and mindfulness spills over with positive benefits in every area of life. Eating more consciously will improve your health. Paying attention to the body and maintaining a natural balance will likewise add years to life and prevent many avoidable problems. Sitting in meditation posture regularly will strengthen the back and, more importantly, strengthen the mind. You will be able to concentrate for longer periods of time and slowly develop a sense of inner peace. Your self-image will improve, and you will find yourself more able to accept your own imperfections and drop the pointless emotional baggage that comes with self-hatred. Chasing after pleasures, excitements, and passions will start to become less alluring because of a well-developed inner security and happiness. The things that people do to get their kicks, whether it be drugs, sex, eating, drinking, or partying, or any other form of thrill-seeking, will start to seem a little pointless. Although these types of things bring temporary enjoyment and a momentary escape from the suffering in life, they never last, and they tend to come with a lot of harmful side effects. Slowly, the truth about it will dawn on us, and we will be in a strong position to change negative habits into positive ones. Buddhist wisdom will show you the cause of all the suffering in the world. You gradually see that people are turning life into hell for themselves by continually clinging to their greed, their fear, and their own hurtful egos. Would there be war and crime if everyone was able to let go of their own sense of self-importance? Change only comes from within. We can show others the way and encourage them to follow it for themselves, but we can never truly change other people. Each one needs to find his own way, and we need to learn to accept this painful fact. Politicians and world reformers will always encounter this stumbling block no matter how lofty their ideals are. Real change starts in our hearts and minds. 
when we are finally so tired of all the pain and longing, we start to look for a way out. And at that point, the Buddha's wise words start to make sense. Conclusion It is important to recognize the power of our emotions and to take responsibility for them by creating a light and positive atmosphere around ourselves. This attitude of joy that we create helps alleviate states of hopelessness, loneliness, and despair. Our relationships with others thus naturally improve, and little by little, the whole of society becomes more positive and balanced. Tarthang Tulku Buddhism today is not quite what it was at the start. Over the 2,500 years, since the life and death of Siddhartha Gautama, these ideas have passed through many different places and have been adopted and modified by a great number of people. There have been influences from China, India, Tibet, and further afield. In recent years, Buddhism has been adopted by the West in a big way and undergone further changes. Some Buddhists chant and sing, wear special costumes and repeat old customs, legends, and stories. Others simply prefer to meditate in silence, leaving all the rest behind. Some seek out the security and peace of a monastery, while others practice on the way to work. Buddhism allows for many individual approaches to the basic truth. There's no need to shave your head or wear a yellow robe to truly be a Buddhist. These are all outward things and take second place to the inner reality that we all face, each in our own individual way. In this book, we have looked at the origins of Buddhism, the life of Siddhartha Gautama, who gave up his princely position to pursue a life of truth-seeking. After his enlightenment experience under the Bodhi tree, he continued to spread this insight to all those who would listen. It was never his intention to become famous, rich, or powerful. He did what he did out of compassion. After his death, the teachings were transmitted from teacher to student until finally some of the events and teachings were set down in writing. Since his ideas were so universal and found application amongst people of many different backgrounds and cultural traditions, it was inevitable that Buddhism would become colored by the traditions of various parts of the world. In Tibet, the locals adopted the basic truth about the mind and the cause of suffering and added many legends and folk tales and a whole repertoire of history into the mix. In China, the ideas of Buddhism found fertile soil amongst those who practiced Taoism, a simple natural teaching, including many new avenues of application for the basics of Buddhism. Today, in the West, Buddhist ideas are extracted from many of these different sources and once again adapted to life in the urban jungle. The New Age movement has combined Buddhist meditation with other ancient ideas and has followed its own line of progression. Buddhism has had a subtle but very important influence all over the world. Since the achievement of inner peace is such a personal thing, none of these outward developments makes much difference to the core message. Getting hung up on all the apparent differences in approach and disputing this or that aspect of one kind of Buddhism versus another is ultimately pointless. We are all different, but the truth remains the same. The Buddha never wanted to be worshipped or adored. He said, He who practices my teachings best reveres me most. What he desired was that individuals would find their own way to liberation from suffering, just as he did. He knew that he could change no one, but hoped to inspire others to reach their own solution. Buddhism didn't need the temples, the robes, the chanting, or the statues. Neither the rich nor the poor are more suitable for Buddhism. If we are honest, we will see that inside each of us are many virtues and many faults. All of our experiences through life have led us to the point we are at now. All of these experiences have had to pass through the same portal in order to affect us this way, the portal of the mind. The mind is the key to happiness, suffering, and the teachings of the Buddha. The mind is also one of the least understood things even today. Though the entire globe has been explored, and most of it has been exploited, the mind remains as the last frontier open to exploration. 
The most important reason for this is our customary dualism of looking at things in terms of subject and object. In science, the mind is a separate thing, connected only with the brain and the nervous system, an object to be explored from the outside. The truth is that when you explore the mind from within, a different story emerges. The lines between subject and object disappear, and you start to become the meditation. You start to disappear, and the whole universe is found inside yourself. In your own personal meditation, you have access to this vast landscape and the infinity of imagination. Meditation and mindfulness are not meant to lead us on a pointless indulgence and vague ponderings over trivial things. They are meant to free our hearts and our minds. By constantly and patiently training your hearts and minds to be harmonious and open, we get back to the natural state we feel we are meant to inhabit. Life and death take on new meanings, and regular life becomes more balanced. Instead of chasing after some illusory ideal of heaven, we realize that it is possible to live in a kind of heaven right here and right now. Instead of being driven to moral activities through the fear of hellfire, we realize that we create our own hells right here by wallowing in self-division, anger, and misguided thinking. Heaven and hell exist side by side, right here and right now. Buddhism is merely a vehicle leading a person to the ultimate truth, which cannot be explained in a single book or even a single sentence. What matters is not the outward trappings of the religion, the religious leaders, or the different approaches. What matters is the realization of the truth. The creators of this book hope that you have found much of value within its pages and given you a balanced and insightful introduction to the diverse world of Buddhism. Whatever your background and your beliefs, it is hoped that whatever you have found of value in these pages will be kept, and whatever is not useful simply dropped. Zen Buddhism contains a beautiful saying which fits nicely here. When someone points his finger at the moon, it is quite silly to focus on the finger rather than the moon. This book is the finger pointing out the moon or the core teachings about Buddhism. Don't get stuck on the book or any particular teaching pointing to the ultimate truth. Instead, seek out the moon itself. Find your own way to the truth. Thank you. If you enjoyed this book, then I'd like to ask you for a favor. Would you be kind enough to leave a review for this book on Amazon.com? It'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you, and good luck. This has been Buddhism, a beginner's guide for the true self-discovery and living a balanced and peaceful life. Learn to live in the here and now and find peace from within. Buddha. Buddhist books by Sam Siv. Written by Sam Siv. Narrated by Dan Gallagher. Copyright 2015. Sam Siv. Production copyright 2015. By Sam Siv.